Good morning, all. Welcome. Any questions before we get started today? All right. Uh, looks like a fair number of people are sleeping in. Uh, not a best choice with an exam coming up around the corner, but let's go ahead and get started for those of you who are here. Today is Tuesday, July 14th, uh, same as it ever was. We are going to do lecture of muscle physiology, uh, finally finishing off our skeletal muscle system, everything you ever wanted to know about skeletal muscle and more. And then we will briefly talk about smooth and cardiac muscle. Lab, we will finish off our origins, insertions, and actions. We had made it to the leg, so we just need to finish that off uh, for the rest of today. And that is everything you're going to be responsible for, which is a very good thing because two days from today, uh, right now, you can start your lab and lecture exam. Again, same format as the last one. Do you know exactly what to expect from this? Uh, you know that you're going to be responsible for uh, taking the lab and lecture exam in any order that you want. Uh, again, it's going to be mostly identification on the lab exam. It's going to be mostly describing processes on the lecture exam. And we've got a lot of processes. So the physiology on this should be pretty simple and straightforward. Then once you're done with that, and it has to be completed within the class time, once you're done with that, take a good 15, 20 minute break, and then I want you diving into the nervous system. Because while the nervous system will not have as much anatomy, uh, I will say the anatomy is probably less intuitive. You know, one of the things we've been able to do with the muscular system is we can look at a muscle, we can look at an origin and insertion and figure out what it does. It's not like you're gonna be able to look at a part of the brain and the part of the brain that moves your hand looks like a hand. So it may be a little less intuitive, but there's a lot less anatomy on that. And then, but there is a lot more physiology. So that will keep us busy for the last couple of weeks. And then uh, you finally get to sleep. All right. Questions on any of that? All right. Then let's dive in. I teased in the last class that pretty much everything I told you about muscular uh, fibers, muscular cells, skeletal muscle cells is a big, bold lie. And of course, that's not entirely true. But one thing we have been doing up to this point in time when we've been talking about our skeletal muscle fibers is we've been talking about them as if they're truly just one thing. And as someone kind of hinted at early on in this lecture series, as we were talking, there are actually different types of skeletal muscle fibers. In fact, there are three main types of skeletal muscle cells. Those three types of skeletal muscle cells can be differentiated in a couple of different ways. One of the ways they're different from each other is in their overall size or their diameter. Let me get my annotation. Uh, some of them are going to be more narrow and some of them are going to be larger in diameter. So there's gonna be some differences in the size. So it's not length, we're talking diameter. But notice also in parentheses here, I have strength of contraction. Why would the diameter of a muscle cell affect the strength of the contraction? I can wait. Why might the diameter of a muscle cell affect the strength of the contraction it is able to produce. Absolutely excellent, right? More sarcomeres, really, more myofibrils, more proteins, right? As you've got, absolutely, there's gonna be more proteins, which means more myofibrils, which of course means more sarcomeres. But we could even be more specific than that. We know those sarcomeres are filled up with myosin and actin, and obviously it is the myosin and actin that pull and so the more myosin and actin you have, uh, the more power strokes you can form, the stronger the contraction of the muscle. So a thicker muscle cell is going to produce more strength. All right, excellent. Another way they're gonna be different is in the speed of the contraction. Remember one of the things that we said is that on average, a myosin head grabs and pulls and lets go and primes, right? Completes a contractile cycle at a rate of five contractile cycles per second. But again, that's an average. As it turns out, some myosin heads go much faster than that. So they are fast myosin heads and they produce a faster contraction. Whereas some myosin heads are slower and those slow myosin heads are gonna produce a slower contraction. 
Myoglobin, remember, as we talked about, is an inclusion, a special protein that allows muscles to store uh, oxygen. Uh, just, like it, just like hemoglobin uses an iron to store oxygen, myoglobin uses an iron to store oxygen. And just like hemoglobin, when oxygen binds to that iron, it gives it a reddish color. As we talked about, that's how our red blood cells get their reddish coloration. Well, it turns out while we said all skeletal muscle cells have a large amount of myoglobin, that isn't entirely true. There are indeed some that have a massive amount of myoglobin in them and that uh, binds a lot of oxygen inside of them and gives them more of a reddish color. Others have far less myoglobin inside of it. So it binds less oxygen. And that's really the other key to this. Yes, it affects the color of this, but what this is really in an indication of is how much oxygen it can store, right? And how much oxygen that muscle cell can store is going to be important on how it produces its ATP. Um, Sorry. Muscle cells will also differ in the capillary supply, the blood supply to them. Some are going to be well diffused and some will be poorly diffused. Obviously, the better diffused a muscle cell is, the more oxygen it's going to be able to get more readily. Uh, and the poorer diffused it is, the less oxygen it's going to be able to get. So again, this is an indication of oxygen uh, capacity or, or ability to get oxygen. Uh, skeletal muscle cells will also, also differ in the amount of mitochondria they have. Obviously, mitochondria are used to make energy. Well, make, yeah, ATP. With our glucose and with oxygen. Notice a lot of these affect how much oxygen is available, how much oxygen we can use to make ATP, which isn't surprising that basically one of the big differences between our skeletal muscle cells is how they produce ATP. What is the primary way they can produce ATP? And as we know, there are two primary ways we can make ATP with oxygen and without oxygen. If the primary way you produce ATP is with oxygen, then we call that, as we talked about, aerobic respiration. And muscle cells who primarily use aerobic respiration, we call them oxidative. If you primarily use your, uh, produce your ATP without oxygen, and let's go ahead and write these here so that we remember that. This is with oxygen, and this is without oxygen. Uh, then you, of course, make your ATP anaerobically, and you are glycolytic in nature. And remember, as we talked about, the other implication to these two processes is the efficiency. If you make it with oxygen, it is an efficient process. Remember, a single glucose can be broken down uh, to produce as many as 36 or 38 ATP. So it is efficient, but remember, we also talked about how it is a relatively slow process. On the other hand, uh, anaerobic respiration is inefficient. Right, that same one glucose only is able to use to be produced in two ATP, but the advantage of it is that it is a fast process. 
And so we'll see this in the abilities of our muscle cells. All right. Questions on this information? These are the ways we are gonna distinguish our muscle cells. So let's make sure we understand that before we start using these categories to describe our different types of skeletal muscle cells. And again, it doesn't say here, but I wanna make sure we're emphasizing all of these we are talking about are skeletal muscle cells. We are still talking about skeletal muscle cells. We're not talking about smooth muscle. We're not talking about cardiac muscle yet. All right, questions on this? All right, you guys know how much I love my stunned silences. Excellent. So let's continue onward. The first specific type of skeletal muscle cell, and again, we're still talking about skeletal muscle cells, are what are called fast glycolytic fibers. Fast glycolytic fibers are the most common type, and there is a lot in a name. When we say these cells are fast, what do you think it is that we are talking about? Speed of contraction. Right, speed of the contraction. And of course, if we're talking about the speed of contraction, what determines the speed of the contraction? Myosinids, absolutely. So these muscle cells have fast myosin heads. And you're right, uh, Ryan, we sometimes refer to these cells as fast, fast twitch cells because they have these fast myosin heads. They can produce a fast contraction, right? Uh, as I mentioned, these are the most common. These are also the largest in diameter. What does that tell us? What did we say was the significance of how thick the muscle cell was in diameter? More proteins. Excellent, perfect. So it has more proteins and it uses those proteins to produce a more powerful uh, contraction. So notice we put these two pieces together and we see that these muscle cells can produce very fast and powerful contractions. All right, so we get very fast and very powerful contractions. However, there is the other part of the name, like a lytic. What did that refer to again? Excellent, it primarily uh, use uh, uh, doesn't uh, pardon me primarily produces ATP and aerobically, which of course means without oxygen. So there are a couple implications of that. If this is the case with, that is producing its ATP without oxygen, does it need to have a massive amount of myoglobin in it? Myoglobin stores oxygen, so we don't need oxygen. So this has very little myoglobin in it. There is a second implication to this part right here. Remember the anaerobic respiration, that myoglobin binds the oxygen, becomes reddish in color. So these are very pale in color. In fact, these cells are often referred to as our white fibers because of that lack of color, because of that lack of myoglobin. They're going to have very few uh, mitochondria in them because again, they don't need them. They're not producing ATP aerobically. Uh, they're typically poorly vascularized. We don't need a massive amount of oxygen being brought to it because it's not going to be using that oxygen to produce ATP, right? But remember, as we talked about, if you're producing ATP anaerobically, this process is fast, 
but inefficient. And so because of that, we are going to need that large gas tank, right? Because again, like we said, if you've got that Hummer and you want to be able to use that Hummer to get around town, you can't get away with a 10 gallon tank. You need to have 50 gallons of gasoline inside your tank so that you're not driving just from gas station to gas station. So it needs a massive large uh, supply of our glycogen inside of it so that it is able to produce its ATP in that efficient manner. And here's the other problem with being inefficient. If you inefficiently use your ATP and you use up your glycogen very, very quickly and you do it anaerobically so you're producing lactic acid, are you going to be able to sustain this contraction for a prolonged period of time? No, exactly. So this is these muscle cells fatigue rapidly. So they're not able, so they can produce a fast, powerful contraction, but that contraction cannot be sustained for a prolonged period of time. So what kind of activities would we use these fast glycolytic fibers for? Excellent, lifting a weight, throwing a ball, throwing a punch, jumping. Fast, powerful motions, exactly, I like that sprint, throwing a ball, right? A lifting weight. All of those are great examples, right? Of those fast, powerful activities, but something that isn't sustained for a long period of time. It is a brief, fast, powerful activity. Excellent, excellent, excellent. I think we basically did this all here, but I do have the pretty words from your textbook to be able to do this. Again, these are the largest in diameter. These are our white cells, with few mitochondria. They produce it anaerobically, large glycogen store, fast contraction because those fast myosin cells, but it fatigues easily. And like I said, this is useful for intense movements like weightlifting or throwing a ball. Excellent. Let's talk about our second type of skeletal muscle cell, slow oxidative. And again, just like we talked about, there's a lot in the name. We say slow, and in slow, we are referring to what? No, not the aerobic respiration. You're right, we're going to get there, but that's not what we mean when we talk about slow. When we talk about slow, yeah, we're talking about the speed of the myosin heads, right? So they are slower, uh, which means they produce a slower contraction. So slow speed of the contraction. Excellent. Yep. Our slow oxidative fibers are also the smallest in diameter. And of course, as we know now, what does that indicate? Absolutely, Edna is correct. Small in diameter also indicates what? Fewer proteins, and if you have fewer proteins, what happens to the strength? Fewer sarcomeres, and what happens to the strength of your contraction? Less powerful contraction. Yeah, exactly. So this produces a... Uh, Less powerful, I like that, less powerful contractions. So the net of this is that it produces slow, weak contractions uh, of those, all right? However, again, there is the other part of the name. Oxidative. With that oxidative part of the name, what does that indicate as, uh, I think someone already mentioned it already. Who was it that said it? Um, Edna, Edna, absolutely, right? It is going to primarily uh, produce ATP aerobically. Excellent, meaning that it uses a uh, oxygen to produce 
ATP. All right. What this means is that it needs to store a large amount of oxygen. So the cell contains a large amount of myoglobin, which of course means that it can store lots of oxygen. But as it also talks about, that means this is going to give more pigment to the cell. And these are what we call our red fibers. Now I know on the surface, this idea of the different colors to the muscle cell sounds like a silly thing, right? Because when you pull that steak out of the fridge and you're getting ready to uh, cut it, it all looks red, right? But not really. Right, because think of it right around the corner. Okay, and I know it's not really right around the corner, but eventually Thanksgiving is going to roll around again. And hopefully by then we'll actually be able to get together with our families to be able to participate in it. And what's the big question you get asked every single Thanksgiving? Well, I mean, besides from the, when are you gonna get a job? When are you gonna get married? When are you gonna have a kid? When are you gonna have another kid? There are all of those, but yeah, absolutely. White meat or dark meat? All right, that's the big question that you get asked, the big conundrum that you have on Thanksgiving, white meat or dark meat, all right? What is the white meat on a turkey? Where is the white meat on a turkey? Breast meat, breast and where else? What's the other piece that's white meat on the, on the turkey? Not a trick question. Or chicken. Wings. Don't anybody eat wings anymore? Wings are white meat. I'm pretty sure Buffalo Wild Wings is pretty much making a living off of the fact that they serve those wings. And that's all white meat. Where is the dark meat? Thighs and legs. Excellent. All right. Think of the life of a turkey. How does a turkey primarily get around? Their legs. Yeah, they stand and they walk, right? So if you think about it, the cells that they need to be able to uh, produce ATP efficiently, produce necessarily slower or weaker contractions because it doesn't take a whole lot to stand and a whole lot to walk. They can stand for hours like we can stand for hours. Is a turkey capable of flight? Yeah, that, no, they can actually, they can fly. It's not their primary way of getting around, but if they need to fly over a fence or if they need to fly up to a tree to sleep at night or something like that, they can produce powerful enough contractions with their wings to be able to fly, but it's not their primary way of getting around. On the other hand, anybody here eaten duck before? Yes. Prepared duck, served duck, Typically when you do the duck, you do the duck breast. And what does that duck breast look like when you get ready to prepare it? Is that white meat or dark meat? It's dark meat, exactly. Because you think of how the duck primarily gets around. It primarily gets around by being able to produce these sustained contractions with its wing. Is it capable of walking? Is it capable of kicking in the water? Absolutely, but it's not its primary way of getting around. So notice the, the types of muscle fibers found in the different areas affect what they're able to do. So what are we? Are we ducks or are we turkeys? Where's our white meat? Where's our dark meat? Absolutely, we are turkeys. Like that turkey, our legs are how we primarily get around. As we've talked about before, how long can you stand for? Ever, right? How long can you hold yourself in that planking position for? Again, in a planking position, you're not even holding up all of your weight, but you're using your breast, you're using your wings, and how long can you hold yourself in that planking position for? Not very long, exactly. So we are turkeys. Our white meat tends to be near the top and our dark meat tends to be near the bottom. All right. Again, not only do we have lots of myoglobin, but we're going to have lots of mitochondria. We are going to have a well-vascularized cell. All the things necessary so that we can efficiently make ATP. 
Again, remember, as we talked about, this is an efficient process. It is a slow process but these muscle cells are producing slow, weak contractions. So we don't necessarily need that massive amount necessary to do the maximal input of a muscle. So it is very, very efficient in making its ATP. And that also means that it is going to fatigue. Well, let's say it this way, it's fatigue resistant. These muscle cells can sustain those slower, weaker contractions for a much, much longer period of time. So, even though I've already pretty much given it to you, right, we are going to use these for things like standing, for things like walking, for things like posture, right? You can stand, you can walk, you can hold still for very, very long periods of time. All right, questions on that? Again, I think we've hit all the important points, but here on the slide, I've got the highlights, small in diameter. There are red cells, aerobic, slow contraction, but fatigue resistant. So they're used for endurance activities, maintaining posture, right? Everything is walking distance if you have the time, right? Slow oxidative fibers. But, we do have a third type of skeletal muscle cells. The combo plate, fast oxidative fibers. So once again, there is a lot in a name. Fast, of course, refers to the speed of the myosin heads. So this produces a fast contraction. Now, if the fast glycolytic are the largest and the slow oxidative are the smallest, then these, of course, must be intermediate in diameter, which also means what? Medium-sized cells, meaning medium-sized strength the strength of the contraction, there you go. Medium amount of proteins, and so medium amount of strength that it is able to produce. So these produce a fast and moderate strength contraction. Again, there's a lot in the name, oxidative, but the other rule that you cannot forget in this class is that anatomists hate you. They make up these rules of how they're going to name these things, and then they like throwing you curveballs. Of course, a name like oxidative should mean that these cells prefer to make ATP with oxygen. But it turns out that our fast oxidative fibers are actually equally able to produce ATP via both aerobic and anaerobic um, respiration. So it can use both aerobic and anaerobic respiration equally easily. They should have come up with a third name for that. They didn't bother. So again, anatomists hate you. So that part is tricky a little bit, but again, this is our in-between cell. So it is going to be intermediate in the amount of myoglobin. Of course, what kind of fibers is that gonna make this? They're not white and they're not red. These must be our pink fibers. Excellent. Uh, intermediate uh, blood supply and uh, mitochondria, a uh, number of mitochondria. Excuse me. So it's intermediate in those that way. Um, 
again, it is able to produce ATP efficiently, both aerobically and anaerobically, so relatively fast, but also relatively efficiently. So they tend to be more fatigue resistant uh, in their uh, action. And they're going to allow for um, moderate activity. Right, things like jogging, things like uh, leisurely swimming. Right, I'm not talking about the massive laps that Michael Phelps is doing or something like that. That would obviously be the, black, the fast glycolytic. Uh, but I'm talking about like leisurely swimming in the pool, uh, jogging, things along those lines are the types of activities uh, that these types of muscle cells would allow. All right. I think we've got all the information there. And again, let's sum it up here with a pretty picture. Intermediate pink aerobic and anaerobic fast contraction, but fatigue resistant for things like jogging and leisurely swimming. All right, so notice your book has this nice table that talks about the three main types of uh, skeletal muscle cells, their characteristics, what they're used for, things along those lines. So yes, we, so that's a great question. You do use muscle cells in combination as your physical activity increases. And here's another important characteristic. We talk about ourselves being turkey-ish, where we have dark meat in our thighs and legs and white meat in our breasts and arms. But um, are those pure muscles? Are all of our slow oxidative in our legs and all of our fast glycolytic in our arms? So we can't do anything fast and powerful with our legs. We can't do any sustained activities with our arms. No, of course not. As it turns out, almost every, and there's that pesky word, almost, almost every muscle in our body is a mix of all three types of muscle cells. Now, being a mix doesn't mean that it is an equal mix. What you see here, for instance, is a great uh, example of a piece of a fascicle. And what's really cool about this particular illustration is this particular illustration, this particular histology slide, is used with a special, special stain that stains, um, that stains uh, myoglobin. So notice the fast glycolytic is almost white in color because it has no myoglobin in it. The slow oxidative fibers uh, have a massive amount of myoglobin in them. And the fast oxidative have an intermediate amount. So notice this is a muscle uh, that has, this particular fascicle has more of the fast oxidative. So again, this would be something like within the leg that you might use for jogging or something that you might use for sustaining activity with your arm or something along those lines. Every muscle is gonna be a mix, not an even mix. The legs do have more slow oxidative in them. Uh, the trunk of the body has more of the, um, you know, the, I mean the arms and the chest have more of the uh, fast glycolytic and so on and so forth. There is one, really six, really 12, exceptions. You have the ability to move your eyes in space, up, down, left, right, all around. The ability to move your eyes is because you have eye muscles, six, so six in this socket, six in this socket, that move the eyes all around. Notice you haven't had to learn those eye muscles, but don't worry, when we get to the nervous system, you will. The good news is it'll take you about a minute to learn them but we're still gonna save it for the nervous system and not do it now. These muscles that move your eye through space are the only pure muscles in your body. These muscles that move your eye in space are 100% fast glycolytic muscles. So it's completely fast switch muscles that move your eyes through space. Every other muscle in your body is a mix of all of these. Right? We see it here in a very high magnification view. Notice here we see a lower magnification view, but again, it's this great um, stain. Uh, this one's colorized where you can actually see the differences in the myoglobin content between the different types of cells. All right, 
Now, here's another important question. Every muscle in your body is a mix of these three types, except the eyeball ones. Does that mean that in our uh, leg muscles, uh, we just finished talking about the bicep femoris, does every single one of us have the exact same amount of physcoglytic, uh, fast oxidative and slow oxidative in our uh, bicep femoris? Do we all have the exact same amount? No. What determines how many of each type you have within a particular muscle? Yeah, primarily it's genetics, right? So if each of us decided we wanted to run 10 hundred yard dashes every day for the next six weeks, and we all got out and we all did that, would we all gain the same amount of speed? Would we all gain the same amount of uh, muscle mass as a result of doing that? No, we all have our own genetic predispositions based on the combinations of muscles that we have, of muscle types that we have, that make us more efficient at some activities and less efficient at others. And as someone mentioned, we are, uh, we do, when you do activities, those activities that you do are going to emphasize the muscle cell types that uh, allow you to succeed in that. Right? You can take two world-class athletes, Meb, right, the famous marathon runner, and Usain Bolt, two world-class athletes. But both of these world-class athletes have been specializing very specific types of muscle cells in their body. So can Usain Bolt, as amazing as an athlete as he is, decide tomorrow he wants to be a world-class marathon runner and be successful at that? Now, I'm not saying he couldn't be successful six months from now or two years from now, but I mean tomorrow. Could he turn around tomorrow and decide that he wanted to be a marathon runner and be successful at it? No, because he has been specializing his fast uh, oxidative muscles. Pardon me, the fast glycolytic, right? Those fast twitch, those powerful, rapid movement ones. All right, so again, we have this genetic predisposition to how they're, the, how they're set up, and depending on which ones we use, will be which ones we are able to maximize the efficiency of. Doesn't mean you can't switch from, you know, one type of activity to another, but it's not going to be instantaneous. All right, questions on any of that? All right, excellent. And with that good piece of news, the good thing is we now have learned everything you could ever want to know about skeletal muscle cells and more. So we are finally done with skeletal muscle and we can move on to our other two muscle tissue types. First smooth muscle and then we'll talk about cardiac muscle. All right. Questions on that? Alrighty, it is way early to be taking a break, but this is a good natural stopping point. We're about halfway through the material and I want us coming to smooth muscle and cardiac muscle fresh. So even though it's a teeny bit early for it, uh, there's been plenty of times where I've made you guys wait late. So it's okay if we take our break a little early. It is 8.40 right now, so let's come back at 8.55. And at 8.55, we will pick up from here talking about smooth muscle and cardiac muscle and then that will allow us to move on to our lab. Any questions before we take our break? All right, I will see you guys in 15 minutes. Let's go ahead and get started. It has been a while since we have talked about smooth muscle and cardiac muscle, so remind me of some of the characteristics, because I already warned you this absolutely positively could be a question on the lab exam. What are some of the characteristics you know about smooth muscle tissue? Tell me what you know about smooth muscle tissue. Excellent, oops. Uninucleated, meaning of course it has one nucleus. You can say it fancy or you can say it unfancy. 
What else? Spindle shape. Excellent. Oops. Uh, highest rate of regeneration. Excellent. Uh, involuntarily controlled. Let's take that one a step further. It is absolutely involuntarily controlled, but what does control it? What are the two things that we can use to control smooth muscle then? Excellent. One of the things is hormones. And what was the other? What branch of the nervous system did we use to control smooth muscle? It wasn't somatic, because remember, somatic is what we use for our skeletal muscles. Somatic is what gives us our voluntary control. Close. Okay, parasympathetic and sympathetic are the two branches of the autonomic. There you go. Excellent autonomic nervous system, but you are absolutely correct. The autonomic nervous system does have two branches, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Excellent. All right, I can think of two other big important ones that we haven't mentioned yet. What are two, at least two other categories about smooth muscle? Characteristics, two other things. Non-striated. There you go. You, the, one of the yeah, exactly. Non-striated. Excellent. But we know it doesn't have stripes. Perfect. Excellent. You guys got the second one as well. Excellent. But let's be more sophisticated. We know it's non-striated, but we also now know what that means. What that means is that it does not have sarcomeres, because we know it is the sarcomeres that produce the precise arrangement that gives skeletal muscle its stripes. So if smooth muscle doesn't have its stripes, that means it does not have sarcomeres, and that means it's going to have a very different mechanism for contraction. It still needs to be able to contract, but it's not gonna use sarcomeres, it's not gonna use the contractile cycle the same way, so it's gonna need some type of different mechanism and you guys are also absolutely correct in that it is mostly, there's that pesky word again, uh, found in the walls of hollow organs. There are some exceptions like the erector pili muscles in our skin, uh, the muscles that move the iris or our lens in the eye, things along those lines. So there are some exceptions, but um, most of it is found in the walls of the hollow organs. Excellent, perfect. So we've got that. I think those are a lot of the good characteristics that we've talked about. You know, and oh, actually, I guess we can add to that. They're found in the walls of hollow organs. And as you can see in the illustration in front of us, they are typically arranged in sheets or layers. So notice here within the wall of our small intestine, uh, and I'll use actually my highlighter to emphasize this, uh, there is one layer that wraps around the muscle cell that way. And then there is a second layer that wraps around it as well. This type of arrangement is commonly found in many of our hollow organs because what we have here, and I think we talked about this a little bit, is as you can see here from the illustration, the arrangement of these. So for instance, the inner layer, this layer here, is comprised of cells that are wrapped around the lumen of the organ. So this is what we call a circular level, circular layer, sorry, where it goes around their circumference of the organ. And let's take that a step further then. If we have a circular layer, like a circular muscle, and it contracts, what happens to our lumen? It's smaller, exactly. So this circular layer is able to change the size or the volume of the lumen. But this green layer, the outer layer, so let's go back here and change the color back to a green. 
basically this layer runs the length of the organ. So this one runs the length of the organ and because it runs the length of the organ, we refer to it and I guess I'm running out of space, so I'll cheat and put it up here. As a longitudinal layer, this longitudinal layer again runs the length of the organ. And if you have a layer that runs the length of the organ and when that layer contracts, what happens to the length of our organ? When a muscle contracts, what does it typically do? Get shorter. So what's gonna happen is this is gonna change the length of the um, organ. So contractions change the length of the organ. These two layers in an organ like the small intestine work together to propel the food through it. So you have that nice big cheeseburger that you had for breakfast that is sitting there in your small intestine. And what happens is the circular layer squeezes it forward and then the longitudinal layer shortens the small intestine and it squeezes and shortens and squeezes and shortens and squeezes and shortens and squeezes and shortens. And as it continues to do that in a rhythmic fashion, we get these rhythmic contractions and these rhythmic contractions basically move or propel the food in this case or whatever the substance is. So let's say substance through the organ. And we have a fancy name for these rhythmic alternating contractions of the two layers of the small muscle. Anybody would know what we call this circular and longitudinal, circular and longitudinal alternating contraction? There's the magic word, peristalsis. Oops. Peristalsis, there you go. Peristalsis is this a uh, contractive process where we get the alternating contractions of the organs to move substances through it. It is how our cheeseburger that you had to, through for breakfast moves through your digestive system. It is how urine is moved from your kidneys to your uh, bladder and from your bladder out of the body. Uh, it is how uh, during reproduction uh, the uh, ejaculate is released from the male and then in females actually a reverse peristalsis in her uh, vaginal canal and uterus and uterine tubes actually helps to draw the sperm up for fertilization to take place. So we have these rhythmic contractions of the smooth muscles in these hollow organs and again the big fancy word for that is peristalsis. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So again, I think we've hit the high points here, but let's go through it again. They're small spindle shaped uninucleated cell with the highest rate of regeneration. And as we can see here, like I just mentioned, typically arranged in layers. Uh, the outer layer is typically the longitudinal and the inner is across uh, the, the circular layer. Notice also that again, um, what I want to emphasize is that those two layers are always perpendicular to each other. Now, typically, the circular layer is the one that is closest to the lumen, and the longitudinal layer is the one that is furthest out, uh, farthest away from the lumen. But notice, because the two layers are perpendicular, when you cut through them, you see the cells at different orientations. Notice this orientation is what we call a cross-section. where we are cutting across the fibers. Whereas if you are cutting the tissue along the length of the fibers, we call this a longitudinal section. So again, we, what we're talking about here is not the type of layer, not what the function of the layer is, but how the, or how the muscle cells are arranged. This is important to remember because if you think about it, and I'm gonna cheat here by drawing my own small intestine. If I were to take a section of the small intestine and I were to take that section by cutting it in a line this way, 
right, then we might see something similar to what we see here. The circular layer would be longitudinal in view, and we'd get a cross-section of the longitudinal cells. However, if instead I took a section through the tissue this way, then it would be the circular layer you would see in cross-section, and it would be the longitudinal layer you would see with a longitudinal section. I apologize for the confusion of this. I know longitudinal layer, longitudinal section use the same words, but what they're describing are two different things. One is the arrangement of the muscle cells, and one is how they appear on the slide. The important thing for you on the lab exam is when you look at a section of the tissue, you should be able to tell the difference between a cross section and a longitudinal section by the way these cells are arranged, right? Because they're going to look differently. When all the cells are laid out longitudinally, they look one way. When you point them the other way, and you cut them this way, they look a different way. So you get to be able to tell the difference between a cross section and a longitudinal section on the exam. Yeah, I almost put that in my coffee. All right, excellent. Questions on that? So finishing off the characteristics we've talked about, non-strayed and involuntary, found in the walls of hollow organs. I will uh, save you the drama uh, that we had last time where at the very end I told you that there were three types of skeletal muscle cells. And I will tell you right off the bat, there are two types of smooth muscle cells. And once again, the name kind of tells you everything about them. The first is single unit, or what is also known as visceral smooth muscle. These are the types that we just talked about in the small intestine. These are the types, this is the most common type, so let's start there. These are the types that are arranged in sheets. Uh, they have gap junctions that connect them together. And in very rare instances, like in your stomach, they can be autorhythmic your stomach actually produces its own action potentials. Your stomach, while you're sitting here, uh, again, or maybe sleeping would be a better example, while you're sleeping, because most people don't eat while they're sleeping, uh, it produces small contractions and contracts oh, about three times a minute. So it's got a very slow rate at which it is producing these contractions that move through the stomach. You then wake up, you have your cheeseburger for breakfast, and it is going to increase the rate of those contractions to churn up that food. Uh, we talked about, I think way back at the beginning, that gut brain that we have when we were talking about the enteric plexus. Well, this is an example of that. These cells are called single unit because they have gap junctions that connect them together. So that when one fires an action potential, that action potential spreads to all the other ones. So it allows this layer to work together so that when that circular layer contracts, it contracts all the way around. When that longitudinal layer contracts, it contracts all the way the length. So it's the single unit where they work together as one. And these are the ones that are found in the walls of hollow organs. So it's the most common type and in the walls of hollow organs. But as we mentioned, there is some smooth muscle that isn't found in the wall of or hollow organs, like the erector pili muscles. Those erector pili muscles are still smooth muscle. We don't voluntarily control this. You cannot make the hair on your arm stand up on edge. It would be an awesome party trick if you could, right? You could woo those of the opposite sex or same sex, whatever your flavor is, uh, at parties by just making your hair wave uh, to them and things along those lines. It would be really cool, but we're not capable of doing that because it is smooth muscle, but it is a different type of smooth muscle. It is what is called multi-unit smooth muscle. This is similarly arranged to what we see in skeletal muscle. There are bundles of these muscle cells like fascicles, and every single muscle cell in that fascicle needs to be stimulated by the nervous system. It's still the autonomic nervous system or hormones that is controlling it, but they don't work together. There are no gap junctions. Each muscle cell is controlled independently. And your book's got a pretty picture that shows this process. Here we have our visceral or smooth single unit. Again, it's called single unit because it works together a single unit. It's called visceral because it's in the walls of our visceral organs. 
notice there's basically only two inputs from the nervous system because all these cells are connected by gap junctions, so they all work together as one. Where here, our multi-unit, I know they haven't done a good job of showing this together in a fascicle. I think they were just trying to show the disarray to make it look different from the single unit, again, artists. But the key is that notice each individual muscle cell has to have its own input within that fascicle so that it can be controlled. And again, a little bit laziness here from our uh, artist. Notice this cell has two inputs to it. Uh, things along those lines, which we know isn't the case. Each muscle cell only gets one. But again, they get the point across, which is what they're trying to do. All right, excellent. Let's get to the fun stuff. How a smooth muscle cell contracts if it does not have sarcomeres. Now here's a great picture of this, but I'm going to actually cheat and bring us to our whiteboard. Here in our whiteboard, we can actually draw our own spindle-shaped muscle cell. And I'll do it as a diamond, because that's basically spindle-shaped. It serves our purpose. That is our cell. We know it has a big centrally located nucleus. I'm not going to bother to draw that. But there's some other important anatomy to this. Much like our skeletal muscle cell, it has a special plasma membrane. And I think I need to lower the size of my... In this case, what is special about the plasma membrane are there are these little pockets on the outer surface. I'll cheat and just draw them. These tiny little caves that are on the outer surface of our muscle cell. I'm just gonna draw it in one location. These tiny little caves, and that's in fact what they are actually referred to as caviolae, These caviolae actually store extracellular calcium. If you think about it, when we talked about muscle contractions in skeletal muscle, all the calcium that that skeletal muscle cell used to move the regulatory proteins came from inside the cell, came from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Well, it turns out our smooth muscle cell has very little smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So again, and it's gonna still be called a sarcoplasmic reticulum. So almost no sarcoplasmic reticulum. So what that means is to move our regulatory proteins, we need a lot of extracellular calcium. Luckily, we have these little pockets on the outer space. And again, I just put it in one location, but they cover the entire surface of our cell. And these are these little pockets that help to keep extracellular calcium close to the cell when it comes time for the cell to use it. Now, we still need myosin and actin. Myosin and actin are still going to be our uh, uh, contractile proteins. And we'll go ahead and make those blue. So what I'll start here with is a single, oh no, don't do that. Let's make a straight line because then it's prettier. There you go, a single myosin here. There is one interesting difference about the myosin in smooth muscle versus in skeletal muscle. Remember on the myosin, all the myosin heads on one side pointed in one direction and all the myosin heads in the other pointed the other direction. That's not the case here. In the case here, all of the myosin on one side point in one direction. So instead of all of it pointing away from the M line, here, all of the myosin on one side point in one direction. 
and all of the myosin on the other side point in the other direction. So it's a slightly different arrangement of our myosin fibers, but we still have myosin fiber, we still have myosin heads, and those myosin heads are still going to pull on actin. So we still need some actin, and we'll go ahead and make actin red. So here is uh, actin this way, and here is actin this way. Now, in our skeletal muscle, actin is bound to the Z-disc, and the Z-disc acts as the anchor. We don't have Z-discs because we don't have sarcomeres. Instead, what we have here connected to the plasma membrane are these special proteins called dense bodies. So let's cheat and draw a line from that up this way and label it. And these dense bodies are distributed throughout the cell. All of them, like I said, connected to uh, the plasma membrane. So there's another dense body and we'll put another one over here and we'll put another one here and another one there and another one there and another one there and another one there and another one there. And these dense bodies not only are connected, so let's say this, Dense bodies connect to the plasma membrane and they connect to each other with the cytoskeleton. In particular, um, via intermediate filaments. So I need my line, I need a different color, orange. There are intermediate filaments that connect all of the dense bodies together. All the way around. So we'll cheat even though we don't see the dense bodies there. We know they're going off in those directions. One's going this way, one's going this way. And this way, and this way, oops, got it. And that one's going up there that way, and that way, and that way, and so on, and so forth. All the way around. All right. And of course, I have not drawn them, but there is myosin and actin between all of these as well. I've just drawn one so that I can focus on just this one. All right. Any questions on the anatomy? Let's go ahead and draw a second one just to make sure we emphasize the point. So they'll put, we'll put another one right here. And again, I won't give it all the detail that the other one had, but again, you'll get the idea. Close enough. Yeah, cheat, do that. All right. Again, my limited drawing skills, but you get the basic idea of this here. Any questions on the anatomy of this before we talk about how this contraction is going to work? All right, so what is going to happen is that just like before, our smooth muscle cell gets stimulated. That stimulation again can come from a hormone, from the autonomic nervous system, or if it is part of the single unit, it can get stimulated via a gap junction from the neighboring cell. When it gets stimulated, it opens voltage-gated calcium channels in the plasma membrane and calcium enters the cell. Calcium moves the regulatory proteins 
I don't have to describe that process to you because you guys already know that. Of course, if this was an essay question, you would have to explain that it binds to the troponin, changes the shape of the troponin, moves the tropomyosin out of the way. But since that part of the process is the same so far, I'm not going to take the time to do that. Although technically, I guess I just did. When it moves the regulatory proteins, then of course, myosin starts to pull on the actin. Notice a couple things happen when this occurs. So let's switch my drawing now and use some arrows and use a color I haven't used yet, green. Notice what's gonna happen is as myosin pulls on this side, this dense body is gonna be pulled this way. And as myosin pulls on this side, this dense body is gonna get pulled that way. So notice what happens is that the dense bodies are pulled towards each other. This is similar to what occurs uh, with Z-discs. However, here's the big difference. The big difference is these dense bodies are also connected to other dense bodies by the intermediate filaments. So notice as this dense body right here is pulled forward, it, thanks to those intermediate filaments, is going to pull on those dense bodies. As this dense body gets pulled forward, it's going to pull on the one next to it. This one's going to get pulled this way. So it's going to get pulled as well. This one's going to get pulled this way. So notice what ends up happening here is that as we get this contraction, we get not just a shortening of the muscle cell, but it starts to twist and starts to bulge as it contracts. Now, as it's doing this, is it going to be producing a very fast or necessarily a very powerful contraction? No, this is going to be a very slow and weak contraction. It's not an efficient mechanism for how these things are produced. It's not producing a big, powerful contraction. But then again, do I need my stomach to be able to pulverize that cheeseburger that is inside of it the same way you could pulverize someone with a punch? No, it produces very slow and very weak contractions. Right? They can be up to 30 times slower than a skeletal muscle cell. But because these dense bodies are interconnected, it is incredibly efficient. And so what happens is it takes very little ATP to do this, and that means these contractions can be sustained for a much longer period of time. So these are incredibly fatigue resistant. As a result of this. All right. Now, again, I've done an okay job of drawing this, but let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. Notice here, we see the anatomy that we were just talking about. I need that, I need that, there we go. So again, it's gonna have the thick and thin filaments. It's going to have myosin and actin. Those are still going to be our contractile proteins, but they are not arranged in a sarcomere. They don't have T-tobules. They don't have hardly any sarcoplasmic reticulum. Right here, you see that centrally located nucleus that I didn't bother to draw on mine. But there is some important anatomy. We have those dense bodies. They are the anchor points for the actin, so they act like the Z-disc that way, but they also connect to the sarcolemma. 
to the plasma membrane. And they're interconnected in this kind of diamond-shaped pattern by those intermediate filaments, by the cytoskeleton. And you can also see two other things. Notice in yellow, uh, well, this one's gap junctions to represent that it's getting the stimulus from the cell next to it. But then also you can see those caviolae, which are those little cavities, those little caves where we're storing calcium outside of the cell. When it comes time for the muscle to contract, myosin pulls on the actin and it pulls on those dense bodies. And notice here with the illustration, you can see not only is it getting shorter, but as I talked about, it is twisting and it is bulging as the muscle cell is doing that. It produces a very slow, very inefficient contraction. Right? It can be up to 30 times slower than the contraction of a skeletal muscle cell. Right? And it's much, much weaker in the strength that it is producing, but this contraction be, can be maintained for a far, far longer period of time. So while it is very slow and it is relatively weak, it is incredibly efficient. And so it can be sustained for much, much longer periods of time. And of course, as we said, alternating rhythmic contractions of these smooth muscle layers is that specialized process we call peristalsis. All righty. Questions on how smooth muscle contracts. All righty, excellent. Perfect, then in that case, we are done with smooth muscle and we can now talk about cardiac muscle. So any other questions on smooth muscle before we move on? All right, excellent. Then, tell me what you know about cardiac muscle. And I don't have a lot of room to write on the screen here, so let's put it here. Let me bring this back up. And go ahead and save that just in case we need it. I'll clear that. Oops, clear that now. All right, so let's talk about cardiac muscle tissue, or more specifically cells. What are some of the characteristics we know? Exactly, they're mostly uninucleated. Excellent. Uh, they are intermediate in size. Excellent. They are indeed striated. Uh, so let's again start there again. We know what striated means. If it's striated, that means that it has sarcomeres. It has myofibrils. And if it has myofibrils, that means we understand the basic anatomy of how it contracts. It is going to contract in a similar, there's that pesky word similar, not identical, but in a very, well heck, we'll even say very, very similar, whoops, fashion to skeletal. Excellent, all right. Uh, oh, good, two more good ones. Uh, only in the heart walls, uh, does not regenerate. And I also saw that magic term, auto rhythmic. What did auto rhythmic mean again? Well, I like that too, branched in shape. Let's add that while we're figuring this out. All right, excellent. Auto rhythmic means it produces its own action potentials. There are special cells inside of the heart where if we pulled them out and put them in a Petri dish by themselves, gave them the oxygen and the nutrients that they needed, they would actually be able to generate their own action potentials on their own. 
All right, smooth muscle won't do that. Cardiac, mu I mean, skeletal muscle won't do that, but there's some special cells in cardiac muscle that does do that. So it produces its own action potentials. What that means is that it controls itself. However, we can modify its behavior. And what are the two ways we can modify its behavior? What are the two ways we can modify the behavior of cardiac muscle? Excellent, there you go, perfect. All right, again, autonomic nervous system and hormones. Excellent, perfect. I think that's everything we've talked about. Am I missing anything? I mean, there's a little more we're gonna add to it, but I think those are all the things we've talked about up to this point in time. All right, I think that's good. Let's go back here. So again, notice it is striated. It has sarcomeres, Z disc to Z disc, Z disc to Z disc, myosin, actin, troponin, tropomyosin, myomycin, all those things, Z discs, all those things we talked about that are in uh, that myofibril of the of the uh, uh, skeletal muscle is found here as well, right? It needs mitochondria to produce ATP. Cardiac muscle is very, very reliant on oxygen. Notice a couple other things. It has a transverse tubule to its plasma membrane, and it has a sarcoplasmic reticulum. But notice it is more of a sparse sarcoplasmic reticulum. There is less sarcoplasmic reticulum and no terminal cisternae, which of course also means no triad. That should be an indication to us that while it does use some internal calcium, it also is going to rely on extracellular uh, calcium for the contraction. So we see that when we look at its anatomy. Oops, I guess I need to cheat and move this out there. And oops, I don't want to make it longer. There we go. Perfect. So less extensive sarcoplasmic reticulum, no triad and it is gonna contract in a similar mechanism to what we've seen in skeletal muscle. But as we're gonna see, it is going to have some differences. In particular, it is the muscle action potential that is going to be very, very different, and that is going to affect how our muscle contracts. All right? So, the good news is we already know half of this story. So let's go back to our whiteboard clear this and divvy it up. All right, one line here. That's a good spot. Whoops, Oops. if I make it straight-ish, that'll work. And one line here. That works. All right, let's talk some things we already know. One of the things we already have an idea about is a skeletal uh, muscle action potential. One of the, what we know about a skeletal muscle action potential is it is a big positive signal. We also know it is very fast. These are things that we've talked about with our skeletal muscle action potential. So let's actually draw a skeletal muscle action potential. We can put a graph here. Anytime we have a graph, we wanna make sure that we label the components of it. So over here is going to be our voltage. And down here is going to, of course, be time. We know that our muscle cell, our skeletal muscle cell, like all cells, has a resting membrane potential. Let 
Ooh, put this over here. Bring that there. Excellent. And we also know what the resting membrane potential of our skeletal muscle cell is. Remind me again what it is. It's the resting membrane potential of our cell. It is negative. Negative what? There we go. Negative 70 millivolts. Perfect. All righty. So far, so good. So let's now draw our rest, our, our, pardon me, our skeletal muscle action potential. We know that if we leave the cell alone, it will stay at rest forever. But when we stimulate it and it reaches threshold, then what happens is it produces a big rapid signal. And again, that is a horrible curve, but you get the idea. Big rapid, actually, let's exaggerate this. Let's go back because that's horrible. So up really quickly and down really quickly. And if you remember, as we talked about, this lasts about you know, one millisecond. It is a big positive signal, right? We talked about it being about a 100 millivolt change. So that means if it starts at negative 70, it gets up to about what would be a 100 millivolt change. Negative 70 plus 100 would equal positive 30. Excellent. It's going to get up to about positive 30 millivolts. All right, so it's a big, huge, positive change. Uh, let's cheat. Move my voltage there so it's out of the way so that I can move that there. There you go. Really, no new information, I guess, other than the positive 30 millivolt change, but all it took was a little math for us to figure that out. That is what our skeletal muscle action potential is. And as we know, one neural action potential equals, gives us one, whoops, one muscle action potential. And as we know, that one muscle action potential is gonna produce one what again? One muscle action potential produces one, does it produce? Test is in two days. One contraction? True, one uh, latent period, contractile phase, relaxation phase, and together, what did we call that? Twitch, there you go, it produces one twitch. Excellent. So we remember that rule, and the good news is, because it's almost certainly going to be one of the potential essay questions you can have on the exam, we know what a skeletal muscle twitch looks like, because we've drawn and talked about one of those as well. So let's do that. Again, we are going to draw a graph. And again, this graph is going to be time on the bottom. And over here is going to be tension. Oops, I guess that helps if I spell tension right. Perfect. As we know, there is a stimulus. So let's go ahead and start with the stimulus. And that twitch has three phases to it. So we start with our twitch. When we produce our muscle action potential, that is the, and then what is the first stage of a twitch called again? Latent period. And how does the tension change during the latent period? No tension change, excellent. So tension stays zero during that latent period. And because I don't have a lot of room, I will cheat and just draw a right LP there for the latent period. Then we hit the contractile phase. During the contractile phase, oops, no, no, hold on. Shucks. Uh, so I gotta do that again. That, and I want it to be pink, and I need it to be 
latent period. So that works, excellent. Now I can switch to green. And we're gonna reach the contractile phase. And how does the tension change in the contractile phase? Tension increases, excellent. So we get an increase in tension during the contractile phase because we know we're opening up calcium channels, moving more regulatory proteins. And as we move more regulatory proteins, more mice and heads can grab and pull. But because our action potential was so brief and immediately goes back to rest, the cell doesn't stay depolarized for a prolonged period of time. So what ends up happening next is we start to see a decrease in tension as it goes back to zero. And what do we call that period of time when the tension decreases and goes back to zero? Relaxation period, excellent. And if you remember the entire twitch, takes about how much time? Anyone remember how much time that entire twitch takes? Well, no, remember five milliseconds was about the time of the refractory period before we could produce another one. But if you remember, the actual entire twitch takes about 40 to 100 milliseconds. All right, the maximum what we talked about was about 100 milliseconds. All right. So while we all might not remember it, believe it or not, what we've drawn here on the left side, there really is no new information. We have just distilled the information that we have talked about so far, knowing how to make a muscle action potential, how that muscle action potential produces one twitch, and we've talked about the components of that in skeletal muscle. So there's really no new information there. So what we can do now is compare this to something new. How this process is going to be similar, but it is gonna be different in our cardiac muscle action potential. Now, here when we talk about our cardiac muscle action potential, we are going to talk about it in a contractile cell. Guess what contractile cells do? Not a trick question. What do you contract. think? There you go, they contract, absolutely. Contractile cells are the ones that generate the force, the ones that pump the blood. Remember, we did mention how there are some special cardiac muscle cells that produce their own action potentials. Those are the uh, conductive cells or the autorhythmic cells. And uh, because of the interest of time, we won't be talking about this today, but when you get to 4.30, and we talk, pardon me, 431, and we talk about the cardiovascular system, you will learn everything you wanted to know and more about those conductive cells. Uh, so we will save that. And like I said, if you have me for 431, that's the very first section we're gonna go into. We're gonna talk about the cardiovascular system and the heart. But for now, we're gonna talk about the cells that produce the contraction, that produce that tension, basically the same type of cells that skeletal muscle cells. Skeletal muscle cells produce the tension. These cardiac muscle contractile cells produce the tension. They too require an action potential. So once again, oops, no, can't be blue, gotta be black. We need to draw a graph. And once again, uh, we are going to be measuring voltage versus time. Once again, we are producing a cardiac muscle action potential. And as we know, an action potential is a big positive signal. However, the difference here with our cardiac muscle is here, it is going to be a big positive oops, prolonged signal. 
the reason for this, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, spoil it for you now, is because it's going to be do a wonky thing. And what makes cells do wonky things? Due to the influx of calcium from outside the cell. Now, we have a resting membrane potential, just like before. And just like before, we have a cell, which if you leave it alone, will happily stay at that resting membrane potential forever. But when you disturb it, when you stimulate it, when you get it to reach threshold, once again, it produces a big, fast depolarization. So again, we are producing a big, positive, rapid signal just like before, just like in the skeletal muscle cell. So that part is the same. What is different is that it doesn't, it doesn't repolarize as rapidly, right? This one had a fast depolarization. Let's actually write that over here. This had a fast depolarization and a, well, let's say it this way, and a fast repolarization. This one has a big rapid depolarization, a fast depolarization, but then what happens is it stays depolarized for a prolonged period of time. And it primarily is able to do this because of the influx of extracellular calcium. After all, calcium makes cells do wonky things, but it is also a double positive cation. So what happens is we get this influx of calcium and the cell stays depolarized for a prolonged period of time. This is a period of time that is known as the plateau stage, where it stays uh, depolarized for a prolonged period of time and eventually depolarizes. It eventually depolarizes to rest. This plateau phase allows the cardiac muscle action potential to be well over 30 times longer than a skeletal muscle, muscle action potential. It produces a much, much longer depolarization. All right, questions on that? All right, well, why this is significant is because just like in cardiac muscle, right, one muscle action potential is still going to equal one twitch. So what we need to be able to do here is describe a cardiac muscle twitch. So for that, we can draw a graph again. And again, stop it. Down here is going to be time. Up here is going to be tension. Once again, the twitch is going to have similar components. We produce the muscle action potential. and it is gonna produce a twitch. And just like before, that twitch is going to have three components. One of those components is going to be the latent period. All 
right, then we are going to get a contractile phase. But if the cell stays depolarized for a prolonged period of time, what do you think happens to the contractile phase? The longer it's depolarized, the more calcium is coming in, the more regulatory proteins that we can produce, and the much longer the contractile phase is going to be. By the same token, once it eventually goes away, the cell is going to eventually repolarize back to rest. I've run out of room there, but you get the idea. So we are going to have that relaxation period where it eventually goes back to rest. But again, it's gonna be a lot longer process. So whereas an entire twitch in skeletal muscle is 40 to 100 milliseconds, a cardiac muscle twitch is over 200 milliseconds in length. It is a much, much longer process. So my question to you then is why? Why have this process be longer? Why do we need a longer contraction from cardiac muscle? All right, I'll ask the question this way. How many of you have ever, part of it is more forceful contraction, but we can also get a very fast, powerful contraction as we know. So part of it is force. But let me ask the question this way. How many people here have ever blown up an air mattress before? How many people here have blown up an air mattress before? Anyone? At least one, excellent. Two, three, four, excellent. Most of you have, perfect. Excellent, or many of you have anyway. Now, and I don't mean the way you do it nowadays where you plug it in the wall and push a button. I'm talking about using one of those pumps, one of those air pumps where you have to pump the air into it, right? That's what I'm talking about. Now, if you're using one of those air pumps to fill up that air mattress, when you're doing that, do you make a whole bunch of really short, really fast movements of that pump? Or do you go the full whole length of that uh, pump to pump the air? Which is more efficient, fast and quick or slow and long? Slow and long. Slow and long, exactly. And you, because when you are pumping that air, the pumping mechanism of something being more slow and sustained and long is a much more efficient pump. Well, as someone already mentioned, our heart is a pump whose job is to pump blood. And so the goal is to produce a longer sustained contraction to have a much more efficient pump than having the heart just take a whole bunch of big, quick reps. It's gonna be much more efficient. Well, not quite AFib, although you're right. AFib is when it's asynchronous in its activity. So AFib relation is when the cells are not working together, not firing together. So that's something else. But that fluttering of the heart is not gonna be an efficient way of pumping the blood. Now, notice we get that nice long sustained contraction. We get nice long sustained contractions with our skeletal muscle too. But with our skeletal muscle, we add uh, twitches together. So here we add twitches together to get that long contraction. And what did we call that process of adding the twitches together? Wave summation, excellent. With wave summation, we were able to add twitches together and we were able to tetanize the muscle. And when we tetanize that muscle, it produced that long sustained contraction where the muscle contracted and kind of locked up into that long sustained contraction. 
we're able to wave summate because remember, we have that refractory period. And the refractory period, remember, for a muscle cell is only about one, skeletal muscle cell, is only about one to five milliseconds. Since the refractory period is one to five milliseconds, we can tetanize the muscle and we can add those waves together and tetanize that muscle. Do we wanna tetanize our cardiac muscle cells? Do we want them locked up in a sustained contraction? Is that no. going to be something that we are going to want our hunt heart to do? Absolutely not. So while the twitch of cardiac muscle lasts about 200 milliseconds, the refractory period of our cardiac muscle cell is over 250 milliseconds. Notice that if the muscle only contracts for 200 and the refractory period is 250, can we wave summate cardiac muscle? No wave summation, no tetanus. Can't tetanize cardiac muscle, which is a good thing. We don't want it to lock up in a sustained contraction that we can't control. Instead, we get nice, smooth, sustained contractions, very efficient in its pumping action. So it's still, we're still stimulating it, we're still moving regulatory proteins, we're still doing the contractile cycle, but because the action potential lasts for a much longer period of time, our contraction lasts for a much longer period of time. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So let's go back here and go through these things again, kind of. Oops, sorry. Hold on. Perfect. Excellent. So like I said, the muscle action potential lasts much, much longer in our uh, cardiac muscle cell because of that prolonged delivery of extracellular calcium. The contraction lengths are much, much different. Skeletal muscle only lasts for about 100 milliseconds, where our contraction in cardiac muscle can last over 200 milliseconds. And we have a much longer refractory period, one to five milliseconds in skeletal muscle, over 250 milliseconds in cardiac muscle. So our cardiac muscle cannot tetanize, whereas our skeletal muscle can. And there's one other big difference between them, right? Remember, to get muscle cells, to get skeletal muscle cells, to work together, we need these motor units. And again, the motor units get the cells to fire and contract and relax together. But remember, cardiac muscle has gap junctions. Oh, that was what we forgot from the anatomy. Remember the anatomy, our branched cardiac muscle cells are held together by intercalated discs. And those intercalated discs have a large amount of desmosomes to hold the cells together and a large amount of gap junctions uh, to hold the cells, I mean, to get the cells to work together as one. So since they have those gap junctions, they work together as one. So there's no need for a motor unit. You already have them hardwired together. And like I said, we're not gonna have time to go over it in this class. Uh, if we were in the classroom, we might be able to, but like I said, I guarantee you'll get the process of those autorhythmic cells when we get to 431. So we'll save those self-excitable autorhythmic cells to, uh, for when we get to 431. All right. Questions on that? All right, your book's got a nice uh, table that does a nice review of all the different types of, of uh, muscle tissue and everything that is involved with that. And with that, we thankfully are done with all of the information we are responsible for on the lecture exam. So we are done with our preparation for the lecture exam. Any questions on that?
All right, excellent. With that in our pocket, then we can now switch gears and go on back and finish up our lab stuff, the origins, insertion, and actions. So we'll come back and start here with the hamstring where we left off last time. All right, we'll first take our break first. This is a good natural stopping point. So we'll go ahead and take our last break here. It is 10 o'clock. So let's come back at 10.15 and we will restart with the lab. So have your uh, origins and insertions handout, have your muscle handout, have your red and blue pens, and we will restart with the lab stuff at 10.15. All right, any questions before we take our break? All right, excellent. Then I will see you guys in 15 minutes. All right, so we left off last time and we were talking about the hamstring. Uh, I mentioned in the last class that I was gonna try to find some pictures for you. I forgot to finish it yesterday, but I got them posted this morning. So I wanna take a quick look at that picture that I was talking about. I've got a couple pictures here that I want to show you. All of these pictures have been added to uh, our uh, lab tools in the lab handouts here. I wanted to start first here. We were talking last time about the iliotibial band, and I think the model in the classroom does a really great job of showing this. It really is this thickened portion of the fascia lata. So again, remember there is a paper that is gonna drape itself, paper, connective tissue that's gonna drape itself all the way around the leg. And this is a thickened portion of it that goes all the way up from the crest of the ilium down to the tibia, so hence its name uh, there. But the other thing we were talking about, remember, is we were looking for that bicep femoris. And we were looking for the short head. Notice the long head and the semimembranosus and semitendinosus have been removed here. So when we're removed here, what we're able to see here, this muscle, and again, notice this little bit here was that part we were seeing before, the part that sticks out from behind the uh, long head. But as we can see now, here we see the entire belly of the short head of the bicep femoris, and we can see how it connects to that uh, linea spera on the posterior part of the bone. So it is a deeper muscle. We have to, uh, the easiest way to see it, we can see a little peak of, piece of it sneaking out, peeking out from beneath the long head, but because the long head sits basically right on top of it, here we see uh, where that entire uh, uh, short head of the bicep femoris would be. All right, so this is a posterior view of the deep muscles that you can see that there. All right, any questions on that? All right, so let's go from one muscle group to the next muscle group, our biggest muscle group, and that biggest muscle group is the quadricep femoris. Uh, the quadricep femoris is made up of four muscles, the rectus femoris and the three vastus brothers, the vastus lateralis, vastus intermedius, and vastus medialis. This is considered an anterior muscle group. But remember, as we talked about when we were looking at the forearm, this is primarily because of the location and orientation of the tendons. If we actually look at the bellies as we will, uh, in their origins as we will, you will see that this muscle really drapes around the entire leg. So it really does lap around the entire leg. The vastus lateralis really is a lateral muscle. The vastus medialis really is a medial muscle right, in this location, but because of their insertion and because of the tendon, it is considered an anterior muscle. So let's start there. We come here, we can go to our origins and insertions pictures. Here we go to the front of the leg. Let's start with the rectus femoris first. What is the origin of the rectus femoris? Anterior inferior iliac spine. 
excellent. So it is the anterior inferior iliac spine. So that is the origin of that. All right. Now here we have two important questions to ask. Let's ask the easy one first. And I'll write this out first before we actually draw it. What is the insertion of, oh, that's a little too big. So let's decrease the size of that, excellent. What is the insertion of the uh, rectus femoris? What is the bone and bone feature that it attaches to? Quadriceps, tendon to patella, and then that patellar ligament to tibial tibiosa. Okay, so, but if I ask for the insertion, remember the insertion is just the bone and bone feature it attaches to. So the insertion, insertion as you correctly pointed out, is the tibial, oops, no, no, hold on. Tibial tuberosity, all right? That is the insertion. So if we again were to draw this, it is, remember, that large bump we pointed out here on the front of the tibia. However, what you also very accurately pointed out for us is what on the exam I will refer to as the insertion pathway. The good news is this is the only insertion pathway you are going to be responsible for. So on the lab exam, if you see a question where I ask you to describe the insertion pathway, you really don't have to even look at the picture because you'll know there's only one insertion pathway you are responsible for. And as you mentioned, that insertion pathway starts with the tendons. So I'll draw it first. Actually, I'll write it out first. So it starts with the either patella tendon, or you could call it the quadricep tendon. I'm gonna abbreviate here uh, just so that it fits in the space. From the quadricep tendon uh, to the patella, from the patella uh, to the um, patella ligament, oops, oops that I meant. And that patella ligament then inserts into the tibial tuberosity. Now we can draw this. So we have all of these muscles, all four muscles, all of their tendons come in and are going to attach to the patella via the patella ligament. Then from the patella, we go bone to bone with the patellar ligament, something we learned in the knee, to the tibial tuberosity. So notice these are two related questions, but they are different questions. If I ask you the insertion of the rectus femoris, it is the tibial tuberosity. If I ask you the insertion pathway, it is the patella tendon or quadricep tendon into the patella, then the patella ligament into the tibial tuberosity. It's a little bit elaborate, but the good news is this is the insertion and this is the insertion pathway for the entire quadricep femoris. So all four muscles of the quadricep femoris have the same insertion oops, pathway. And this is way too big, so let's cheat, make it a little smaller. And then I can sneak it here. And then I'll put this over here so it's out of the way. Excellent. So for all four of these muscles, the insertion and the insertion pathway is the same. It is identical, so you get to learn it once, you get to use it four times for all of these. All four of these are the same. Because remember, after all, a muscle group shares at least one attachment point. Notice for the hamstring, that attachment point was the origin. 
the semimembranosus, semitendinosus, and the long head of the bicep femoris all originated from the ischial tuberosity. Well, here, the rectus femoris, the vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, vastus intermedius all insert into the tibial tuberosity, and they all use the same insertion pathway. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Now that we have the insertion pathway uh, and the insertion for these muscles, let's talk for the rectus femoris about its actions. How many joints does our rectus femoris pass through, pass over? Two, excellent. So it passes over two. And notice the name, it is the rectus femoris. Let's actually go back to the picture. Here in the picture, and actually, you know what? Let's actually cheat and do this instead. Do I have a good picture of it? I don't. Awesome. We've got a, big, a better picture here. This is, okay, this will be enough of it. This was here for another reason. But if you notice here, if you remember our rectus uh, femoris, rectus meaning straight, like we have the rectus muscle in the abdominal regis, uh, the rectus femoris, remember I mentioned, was one of the strongest muscles of the body. The reason for that is it is that bipennate muscle. It has a single tendon that goes down the center of it, and you can see it has two rows of fascicles connecting to it from two different angles. So there is a massive number of fascicles all on this one tendon. And so because of that, uh, there is a lot of hands on this one rope and it produces a tremendous amount of strength. One of the strongest muscles of your body based on its size, because again, it's got to move that big, huge, massive meat that is your leg around in space. So it is this one of the strongest muscles in the body and it has that important bipennate shape. So if we go back to, well, actually, no, we're going to stay here and go back here there there and clear my image oh man i got rid of here so i wonder if i can how far back i can go with this not far enough all right anyway so let's just draw the origin and insertion again anterior inferior iliac spine ischial tuberosity. Straight muscle with a straight tendon that goes straight from one location to the other, right on the anterior side of the body, crossing two joints, as we mentioned, the hip and the knee. So crossing the hip being an anterior muscle, what is its action going to be? Excellent, it is going to flex the hip. Being an anterior muscle, what is its uh, effect on the knee going to be? Extends the knee, perfect, excellent, all right? So big, powerful muscle here on the front, crossing two joints. Okay, now I need to cheat and make this line a little thinner for that tendon that connects it together. Because notice also here, when we look at our illustration, and this is why the illustration is nice for this, there is a muscle that is deep to the rectus femoris, and that is the vastus intermedius. As its name, vastus intermedius indicates, it is the intermediate uh, vastus muscle. We already know its insertion. Its insertion is gonna be the tibial tuberosity. That's going to be the same. But what's different about the vastus intermedius is its origin. What is the origin of the vastus intermedius? Internal lateral surface of the femur? Yeah. So basically it is here on the anterior and lateral portion of the diaphysis. Oops, I went a little too medial on that, sorry. I'll just cheat and draw it this way. There we go. 
So if we draw the belly of it, and we'll use brown for this, and again, remember it is going to insert into the tibia the same way, and then we go back and we draw our rectus femoris over the top. Much like we saw with the long head and the short head of the bicep brachia, the rectus femoris literally sits right on top of the vastus intermedius. So notice when we look at the pretty picture from your textbook, the only way they can show us the vastus intermedius is to cut a portion of the rectus femoris out so we can see that deep muscle underneath. All right, now notice one other thing as well. They share the same uh, or uh, pardon me, they say, share the same insertion. So apparently I lose that entirely every time I go to it. All right, so let's just draw the uh, vastus intermedius. No, no, hold on, stop doing that. Draw red, big line. There's its origin, there's its insertion. Unlike the rectus femoris, uh, pardon me, unlike the rectus femoris, how many joints does the vastus intermedius cross? Just one. Notice this one does not go across the hip. This one just crosses the knee. And again, it is considered, and it is, an anterior muscle on the front of the leg. Uh, so what is an anterior muscle due to the knee? It is going to extend it. Excellent. Right, so group one, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, for this one, show me the difference between the actions of the rectus femoris and the vastus intermedius. How are they different in their functions? Can you give me, can you demonstrate both of the things for us? How they're different from each other? Patricia, are you going to do it or? All right, I'll just do it. Um, oh, I can do it. Okay, right. see me. Okay, perfect. Um, so for the rectus femoris, mm -hmm. um, what I came up with is like doing lunges. Okay. Um, I don't know if you can see. So like just like that. Okay. <laughs> and then. Wait, so stop there. So be careful. When you're there, you're absolutely flexing your hip. But if you're doing a lunge, then remember, you're also flexing your knee. So remember, this flexes the hip, but it also extends the knee. So if you're taking the step out to do the lunge, that would be when you would be using this. The actual bending of the knee is a flex, though. So you have to extend the knee as well as extending the hips when you're doing that. Okay? Whereas... If you're just using, so what would you just use the vastus intermedius for? Um, maybe like doing this with like a soccer ball. Uh, okay. Again, you're flexing the, your knee when you do that. You remember extending, the knee is the one that is screwy. The knee is the one joint that is different. An anterior muscle of the knee makes the knee extend. So and notice here, I've got, I'm flexed to the knee and I'm extended. So right now I'm using my rectus femoris. I've flexed and I've extended. In this case, if you're just using the vastus intermedius, you are just extending the lower part of the leg. I always think of like those river dancers. If you think about river dancing, really all they do is just move from the knee down. So that stomping, or if you don't get your way, I don't wanna go to work today. And your wife says, tough, you have to teach, get out of here, right? That stomping is that use of the vastus intermedius, the extending of it. I know the knee is the one wonky one, but you got to remember that everything front on the front flexes except the knee. Everything on the back extends except the knee. The knee is the wonky one. All right. Excellent job. All right. Questions on that? All right, the good news is the actions for the vastus lateralis and the vastus medialis are going to be the same as those for the vastus intermedius. They all have the same action. They all extend the knee. But what is different about them is their origins. 
So let's start easy. We know they are going to have that insertion that is the tibial tuberosity. We know they're gonna have the insertion pathway that is quadricep tendon into the patella, patella ligament into the tibial tuberosity. But what is going to be different about them is their origins. Let's start with the vastus medialis. The vastus medialis is an, considered an anterior muscle because its tendon comes to the front. But it really is a medial muscle where the muscle is located on the medial aspect of the femur. And we see that in its origin because some of its origin is on the front of the femur and some of the origin is on the back of the femur. So what is the origin of the vastus medialis? So here in red, we'll do the vastus medialis. What is the origin of the vastus medialis? All right, so- Linea spera. Excellent, those are the two, right? It starts here on the intertrochanteric line, right, on the anterior side, remember between the greater trochanter and lesser trochanter, but on the anterior side. So it starts there on the front, grabbing onto the front, but, and I'll do it as a dotted line just to remind ourselves that that linea aspera is on the back of the femur. So this is, and we'll put a little P here to remind us that this is posterior as well. It starts on the back as well. So notice, and we'll cheat, and let's see, I'll use purple for this. If you think about it, the fascicles from the vastus medialis basically wrap up and around, wrap up and around, wrap up and around, wrap up and around. So as we look at the illustration, and I'm not gonna go back and forth because as I do, we'll see that it's going to erase what I'm drawing here. So, we'll, but we'll, it, it'll be a point we'll make sure to emphasize when we look at it. We really do see the fascicles of the vastus medialis coming around the aspect of the leg from the back towards the front, wrapping around into the front. So it's grabbing onto the side of it, front and back side of the femur, but because its tendon goes into the front, it is still considered an anterior muscle. And what do anterior muscles do to the knee? They extend the knee, exactly. All right. Now, notice the femur is pretty small and these are large muscles. So not surprisingly, the vastus lateralis has a very similar origin. Posteriorly, it is going to insert from that same, uh, pardon me, originate from that same uh, linea spera. It is going to originate from that same intertrochanteric line, but being the lateral most muscle of the rectus femoris, it also originates from the lateral most bone feature of the femur. And what is the lateral most bone feature of the femur? I'm gonna draw it even though I'm waiting for somebody to say it. There you go, the greater trochanter, excellent. And since I have to fill that in, I'm gonna make my line bigger. There we go, excellent. It also is going to have fibers, and I'll use yellow for it this time. And again, these fibers are going to wrap around the leg from the back around to the front and come into our tendon and down. So the vastus medialis really is medial. The vastus lateralis really is lateral. There is one other big difference between them as well. Because the vastus lateralis starts up here at the uh, greater trochanter, the vastus lateralis is more superior, or let's say proximal, because that's the correct term, is more proximal, higher up on the leg, where the vastus medialis is more uh, distal. And we'll see that with the bellies, and we'll see why that's significant in just a minute. All right. Any questions on these drawings before I switch to some of the pictures we need to look at? 
All right, so let's start here since I'm on this already. Let's see if I don't. So here are the bellies of the uh, vastus medialis, uh, rectus femoris, vastus lateralis that we see there. Although, like I said, that isn't necessarily the best view. This is a better view of at least two of them. Let's clear our drawing. This here is the rectus femoris, and notice you can actually see they've got the tendon on this one from the top. This one here is the vastus medialis. And notice, I want you to notice something about the vastus medialis. The vastus medialis, remember, as we talked about, is the more inferior one. So the big round belly of this is always going to be right next to the knee. Whereas the lat vastus lateralis, which we can't see right now, is going to be more uh, superior or really more proximal in its orientation. And we'll see that when we look at the pretty picture from the textbook. Notice when we look at the pretty picture from the textbook, again, we can see uh, the fascicles, the vastus medialis coming down and around from the medial side. We can see the fascicles from the vastus lateralis coming around from the side, from the back into the tendon and coming down that way on the lateral side. And again, notice the belly of the vastus medialis is distal, where because the vastus medialis starts higher, its belly is more proximal. The reason this is significant is because while this may be what a normal natural leg looks like, occasionally we get legs that look like this. As these bodybuilders build up these legs into these big, huge, massive chunks of meat, at first it may be challenging to be able to identify the muscles. However, as we talked about, there's some key characteristics to these that are going to allow us to identify them. First, no matter how big your leg gets, you still have that patella bone that is easy to find. And if you can find the kneecap, the patella, then you can find the belly of the vastus medialis. So there is the vastus medialis right there, right next to the kneecap. No matter how big these muscles get, this relationship of the kneecap to the vastus medialis stays the same. Of course, if that is the vastus medialis, then that makes this over here the vastus lateralis. So then where the heck is my rectus femoris? I don't see them in between them. Well, it turns out the vat, that rectus femoris is this muscle right here. Notice you can actually see the tendinous insertion. Remember, as we talked about, it is that bipennate muscle. And this is the problem with these bodybuilder legs when they look like this. Notice the muscles and the fascicles are getting massive as they build up the leg. But what happens is the tendon of that rectus femoris doesn't elongate. So as the muscles get bigger and swell, it pushes the rectus femoris up and the relative length of the rectus femoris actually gets shorter. Notice it's getting wider, the muscles getting bigger, the muscles getting stronger, but it's not getting longer. And so those other muscles are kind of pushing it up and out of the way, including the vastus intermedius underneath it. And notice one more thing, no matter how big that leg gets, are we ever going to see the vastus intermedius on our bodybuilder? No, because that rectus femoris sits on top of it. It's pushing the rectus femoris up, it's making the rectus femoris look shorter, but we're not gonna be able to see it. So using those couple landmarks, the kneecap is your big landmark, realizing that the rectus femoris is going to get shorter. And like I said, and I'll clear the picture so you can see it, notice you can clearly see that tendon down the center of the rectus femoris. Those are some characteristics that will make it very easy to identify these quadricep muscles on our bodybuilder. All right. Oops. Questions on those?
All right, excellent. Just that easily then we have gotten out a big chunk of our muscles and our last big muscle group. There are some other muscles we need to be able to identify. And the first one of these is the muscle that is the gracilis. This is the medial most muscle of the leg. All right, it is superficial and it is medial. We can see it very nicely on the inner side of the leg. If we go back to our leg model, notice here on our leg model, this muscle right here, this medial most muscle of the leg right there is the gracilis. But where I think you get the best appreciation for what the uh, gracilis is and what the gracilis does is if we draw the origin and the insertion. The origin of the gracilis is the bone feature that is about as medial as you can possibly get. So if we are, there we go. What is the medial most bone feature we can possibly get on the pelvis? The well, ischial tuberosity, I mean the pubic symphysis is probably the most medial thing here, but we don't wanna be quite right on the midline. So you are absolutely correct right here, right next to the pubic symphysis on that inferior ramus of the pubis is our origin of the gracilis. So I'll put a big G next to that to remind us that this is the origin of the gracilis. It starts medially and it ends medially as well. What is the insertion? of the gracilis. If only I had a list of the correct answers sitting in front of me, it would be so much easier to answer these questions for the instructor. Ah, there you go. Notice down here on the medial condyle of the tibia. Didn't we have two other muscles that inserted into this exact same location or a, a central location? Well, I'm asking the question, so what's the obvious answer? Yes. In fact, yeah, there you go. Semitendinosus is one of them, and the other is the semimembranosus. In fact, there isn't three, there is actually four muscles that all insert into this same essential bone feature. That makes it fun on the exam because on the exam, I could show you a tibia like this. I could have an arrow that, well, okay, it wouldn't be that big. Um, I could have an arrow. Of course, it would be a real bone, not a picture. But I could have a real bone with an arrow pointing to this region, the uh, inferior medial condyle of the tibia. And I could ask you to identify all the muscles that insert into it, and you get to write down four answers. The semimembranosus, the semitendinosus, the gracilis, and one more we will see in a moment. All right. But for right now, we're just going to focus on the gracilis. So notice, and we'll go ahead and take our black line to go ahead and draw it. This is a muscle, oops, I need that, there we go. Starts medial, stays medial, and goes down the length of the leg. Medial muscle crossing four, two joints, the hip and the knee. All right, questions on that? All right, how many actions does the gracilis have? Four, excellent. What are they? A deduction. Okay, excellent. Being a medial muscle, not surprisingly, one of the things it is going to do is a deduct the leg, bring the leg in. What else? 
being a medial muscle, not surprisingly, it immediately rotates the femur. And being a medial muscle, it's basically a strap-like muscle that comes down this way. So if you think about it, when it contracts, it kind of collapses the leg. And if you think about collapsing the leg, that would be a flexing of the knee and a flexing of the hip. So it flexes the knee, flexes the hip, AD ducks, and medially rotates. So those are the four actions. Group six, what did you come up with for us? What activity helps is gonna help us to remember all four of these really confusing looking actions? Okay, so it's really stupid, but like when a kid really needs to pee and they kind of like squeeze their legs together. So exactly. like, I think no, I think that's a great example. The pee pee dance. There you go. Exactly. They like bring their knees together. There you go. I think that that is a great example of this. I had a student uh, several years ago who actually uh, t did a picture for me so that I could use it. So let's switch to back to the lecture. I like the pee-pee dance. That's the one that I always think of for this. But she referred to it by what she uh, called her fangirl dance. So if you think about when you're that fangirl, there you are on the beach, and one of the Jonas Brothers walk by, right? You do your little fangirl dance. Notice she is flexing her hip. She is flexing her knee. She is adducting her legs, bringing them together, and she is immediately rotating them. So again, this could just as easily, if they weren't happy, be a child doing a pee-pee dance, or that could be me doing the fangirl dance when I see One Direction. All right, questions on that? All right, notice, and let's go back to here. We said there were four muscles that inserted into our medial condyle of the tibia. So I know I've lost my picture, so we will redraw it again because it is important to have it here, starting first with our gracilis. So again, our gracilis starts here on the uh, inferior ramus of the ramus of the uh, pelvis, pubis, inferior ramus of the pubic bone. Uh, and again, whoops, need this to be red. This is going to be the origin of the gracilis. So we put the G by that. And as we mentioned, they are going to draw, insert into the medial condyle of the tibia. So I can draw that muscle that starts medial and stays medial. All right. But the muscle we want to compare this to is the sartorius. The sartorius is the longest muscle of the body. Now, does longest necessarily mean strongest? No, of course not. Uh, it, and in fact, it is a narrow strap-like muscle. But it is a muscle that starts lateral and being the longest muscle not surprisingly it is going to originate as far up on the as far up on the pelvis as it possibly can so what is that highest point the origin of our sartorius If only I had the list of terms right in front of me, it would be so easy to answer these questions. There you go. Up here on the superior anterior iliac spine. It is as high up, so this again is going to be our origin of our sartorius. As high up on the pelvis as it possibly can get. Its insertion is the exact same insertion as the gracilis. So notice, as we mentioned, our semi-tendinosis, I'm just gonna abbreviate these things, our semi-membranosis, our gracilis, and the sartorius, all four of these insert into the exact same, and again, it's not quite the exact same, but what is essentially the exact same point on the tibia. Notice the difference is the gracilis starts medial and stays medial, 
So our gristillus starts medial and stays medial. Our, our sartorius starts lateral and then goes medial. So this strap-like muscle starts way up here and then it basically comes down, wraps around the leg, around the head of the medial malleolus and forms this nice big S-shaped muscle as it wraps around the leg. So again, like the gracilis, it's the strap-like muscle, but unlike the gracilis, this one starts out here lateral and comes across medial. So notice these two muscles share actions. They both are gonna collapse the leg. So they both are going to flex the hip and flex the knee. But the gracilis was medial, so it adducted and medially rotated, where the sartorius is lateral. So it is going to abduct and laterally rotate. So in this fashion, they share two actions, but they also, because the sartorius is lateral, it is going to pull it out. Let's look at some of the pictures for this, and I wanna start here with the leg model. Notice here, one of the reasons I got this particular picture is that notice we can see, and I'll go ahead and just highlight these in black. Here is that strap like sartorius, starting lateral, coming across medial. Notice it wraps around the medial head, uh, the vastus medialis, and comes into the medial condyle of the tibia. Here is the gracilis starting at the pubic symphysis, essentially, on that uh, inferior ramus of the pubic bone, staying medially and coming down into essentially that same insertion point. And then notice here, we see a little bit of the semitendinosus on top and its tendon coming in here. And this is that wider semimembranosus and it's coming in to this location as well. So notice one, two, three, four muscles all basically come into this same portion of the tibia, right underneath the medial condyle of the tibia. All right, notice there's our tibial tuberosity. There's our patella. Here is that patella uh, ligament pardon me, patella tendon into the patella ligament. There's our insertion pathway of the quadricep muscle. And then right there next to it, we see that insertion of those four muscles on our tibia. We see the same thing when we look at our picture here. Again, notice here, we have that medial gracilis, starting medial, staying medial, coming down. And again, here is that long strap like sartorius. Again, longest muscle, but not the strongest, starting as high up as it can get, right up here on the superior anterior iliac spine, starting lateral, wrapping around, and coming in medially onto the tibial um, condyle, middle condyle of the tibia. All right? Questions on that? Of course, I gave you guys an example of this, so you can either use mine or you can come up with another one. Group five, what did you come up with for an activity that uses all four of these actions of the sartorius? Flexing the knee, flexing the hip, abducting the leg, and laterally rotating the leg. I think this is like a kick the ball. Okay. So, so. You're going to demonstrate? Perfect. Excellent. Although the only thing I would say is that, oh yeah, perfect. No, that's actually perfect. Yeah, absolutely. It's like when you're doing that hacky sack, you are, you are laterally rotating it, you are abducting it, flexing the knee, flexing the hip. That is perfect. Excellent. I like that. So yeah, kicking a ball, like, you know, juggling a soccer ball or hitting his hacky sack or something like that. That is spectacular. Excellent. All right. Questions on that? All right. Perfect. That is the end of the muscles of the uh, hip that affect the hip and also the knee also that you need the origins and the insertions of. But there are a couple more muscles we need to talk about up here in the proximal part of the leg. Starting first with another big important muscle group. 
This muscle group is known as the iliopsoas. It's called the iliopsoas because it's basically made up of three muscles, two and a half muscles. The first muscle, notice, is here inside the fossa of the ilium. Again, you don't need to know its origin and insertion, but being able to find it is definitely useful. That is the iliacus. And then notice up here, and I'll change the color of this, there are two muscles. One is this bigger muscle known as the psoas major. And notice there's this tiny muscle with a long tendon right here in between it, known as the psoas minor. Now I mentioned two and a half muscles because in some individuals, the psoas minor just fuses with the psoas major, and so they're really not two different muscles. So for some people, this is just one muscle, for some people it's two muscles, but these one and a half muscles and the iliacus together form the iliopsoas. And most importantly of all, do you have to worry about the individual names? Do you have to worry about whether or not you can find a psoas minor to identify it? No. No, you just need to know them collectively as the iliopsoas. Our illustration shows this nicely, but the other place we see this nicely is going back on our leg model. So there we go. Notice, and here's a couple important things on this one. Oops, bring that back, let me go back. For starters, notice here from the superior anterior iliac spine, we see the sartorius muscle going on its merry way, right down along this way on its strap like. But notice we see something else, something white that connects the uh, anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle. Anyone remember what this particular structure is? If on the exam, I have this picture and I have a nice big arrow pointing right at this and I ask you to identify the structure. Your answer is indeed the inguinal ligament. Excellent, that is the inguinal ligament. Notice what's cool about this muscle is that it starts inside the abdominal pelvic cavity. The job of this muscle is to move the body through space move more specifically the leg through space. And as we talked about, that leg is a big, huge, massive hunk of meat. So connecting it to the pelvis, connecting it to the lumbar vertebrae, give this muscle a very solid base uh, where it comes together. And notice as it comes out underneath the inguinal ligament, all the fibers have fused together into one muscle group. So we see a teeny bit of it here sticking out underneath our muscle. But notice it's mostly located in the abdominal pelvic cavity. In fact, if we look at a model of the abdominal pelvic cavity, like the torso we have in the classroom, look once again, here we see that psoas major, the psoas minor, and the iliacus. Here we have these muscles together coming through the inguinal ligament, peeking out just a little bit down here, we have that iliopsoas. Big solid anchor, big solid base inside of the abdominal pelvic cavity. And again, even though it's inside the abdominal pelvic cavity, it attaches to the front of the femur, it is considered an anterior muscle. So what is the one and only effect that this muscle has on our hip? flexing the hip, absolutely. It's that big, huge hip flexor bringing and swinging that big, huge chunk of meat up into space. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Let's identify the next muscle you are responsible for. The next muscle you're responsible for is the adductor magnus. The adductor magnus is a medial muscle, but it is a deep muscle. So let's peel away some of the pesky leg. And as we peel away some of the pesky leg, whoops, stop. Here we see the adductor group. The adductor group actually is comprised of three muscles, the adductor brevis, 
the adductor magnus, and the adductor longus. You are not responsible for all of them, you're just responsible for the adductor magnus. And notice, as you can see, it is a medial muscle, but it is deep to the gracilis. If we go back to our model pictures, notice when we were looking at the medial aspect of the leg, this superficial muscle right here was the gracilis. Well, this muscle right here, right behind it, this muscle right here, right behind it, so deep and posterior to the gracilis is our adductor magnus muscle. We don't have to worry about origins and insertions for the adductor magnus, but we do have to worry about actions. What are the actions of the adductor magnus? All right, flexing what though? Flexing and adducting what? So those are, again, those are exactly the kind of answers that are perfect for partial credit on the exam. Remember, you need to say the action and the part of the body that it moves as well. So excellent. So it adducts, immediately rotates, and flexes the thigh. Three different actions all on the thigh. Excellent. And group two, why don't you demonstrate for us what uh, you came up with to help us to think of adducting, immediately rotating, and flexing the thigh? Um, I thought about... Angelina Jolie, when she's at the Grammys and she always shows her leg, she kind of goes like this. That's, that's perfect. Like, oh. Absolutely, because you're flexing the leg, you're adducting it, bringing it in, and immediately rotating to cross it across. Excellent. I like mm -hmm. that very, very much. Perfect. All right. So there you go. You have that action of the abductor. Now, notice, obviously, with a name like adductor magnus, what is its primary action? Not a trick question. To adduct. To the adduct the leg. And how often do you actually have to adduct your leg? Right? On the instances where you abduct your leg, do you really have to contract any muscles to bring the leg back down again? Did I have to contract no. my adductor to bring my leg back down? What no. brings my leg back down? It's not a trick question. What's the primary force that brings my leg down when I lift it up? Gravity, exactly. Now, if you go to the gym, are there machines that help you to work these adductor muscles? Yeah, it's these big torture devices you have to get into that spread your legs apart and you have to squeeze them together. And the whole time you're doing that, you cannot make eye contact with anybody when you're on that machine, right? No eye contact when you are on that machine, right? When you're on there, but it's not a very fun, it's not very useful, and not a lot of people use it, right? Let's go back and take a look at our bodybuilder's leg. Notice again, we see the tremendous definition of the vastus medialis, the tremendous definition of the vastus lateralis, the tremendous definition of the vastus lateralis, in fact, if you look closely, notice you can even see the strap-like muscle that is the sartorius. Notice you can see it starting over here laterally and coming around medially. But as you look here at the inside of the thigh, do you see a, a good definition to the adductor or do you see good definition to the gracilis? Even with these massive bodybuilders, we don't really tend to work the inside of the thigh because gravity pretty much does its job. And that's the problem with the adductor magnus. In sports, right, this is a muscle that doesn't get a lot of work. It doesn't have as much tone. And so it tends to be a little bit weaker. So that linebacker tackles the running back and twists his leg, or that a baseball player is sliding into second base and gets twisted. And you hear all the time about athletes getting groin injuries, right? Does groin injuries mean that they have uh, had some damage to their testicles? 
right? No, that's a whole different type of injury. When you hear about athletes being out with groin injuries, I would say about 75% of the time, what they have done is strained their abductor magnus muscle. So in about 75 to 80% of all groin injuries that you hear about in athletes, uh, what they've typically injured is that abductor magnus muscle. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Let's go from here then back to one last muscle. And that is the tensor fascia laudia. Notice, and again, I think I grabbed that picture from your textbook because I think, or not from textbook, from, from the model, because I think it does a better job of showing this. Notice here again, we have that iliotibial band. So here we have that long iliotibial band. But notice there is this small muscle right here. Again, you don't need to know its origin and insertion, but it also starts from the superior anterior iliac spine. So if we cheat and go back to this picture, notice here we have. Again, the sartorius here coming from the superior anterior iliac spine and guinal ligament coming from the superior anterior iliac spine. And then here coming out lateral is that tensor fascia laudia. So if we go back to this picture, clear it again, uh, we have this muscle right here, anterior lateral muscle that connects to the fascia lata connects to the iliotibial band, and with a name like tensor fascia laudia, its job is to put the pressure. Remember, we talked about how that fascia lata is that pressure cuff that helps to draw the blood back up to the heart. And so this is the way that we keep tension on that fascia lata with that tensor fascia laudia. All right? Now, that is its real true function, but it can be a stabilizing muscle. It can be an accessory muscle to help in other actions. And being an anterior and lateral muscle, how many actions does it have? Two. Being an anterior muscle, what do you think the anterior action of it is? flexing the thigh, being a lateral muscle. What do you think the lateral action of it is? Abducting the thigh, so there you go. Its location tells you everything about it. Perfect. And again, if we go back to our slides, we have our bodybuilder. Notice, right, unfortunately, our bodybuilder is wearing those pesky shorts. But if like some bodybuilders, he was wearing less uh, or more revealing shorts, what you can get a hint at right here is notice you can actually see the very beginning in some of these bodybuilders, this tensor fascia lata muscle becomes this huge bulge that sticks out on the side like they got their wallet in their pocket. It can be a pro quite pronounced muscle. We see just the hint of it like I said, because he's wearing those pesky pants, uh, but I'm sure you could do a web search for tensor fascia lot of bodybuilder pictures and get an eyeful of that nice, big, large muscle that you would see on that anterior lateral aspect of the thigh. All right. Questions on that. All right. With that then, are we on time? We're doing perfect, excellent. With that then, we are now finally down to the last part of the leg, the lower part of the leg. And the last muscle we need to be specific on. That last muscle is the uh, most common and most misnamed of all of the muscles, and that is our gastrocnemius. Of course, we will call it gastrocnemius in this class, but everybody outside of the class, what do they refer to it as? The 
calf muscle. Calf muscle, absolutely. All right. One of the interesting things we will see is that your gastrocnemius, your calf muscle, is actually very, very similar to your bicep brachia. Notice, like the bicep brachia, it is a superficial muscle. Like the bicep brachia, it has two bellies that are side by side. Like the bicep brachia, where you do the curls for the girls, right? Calf size is something that is very important to some individuals. Back in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean the 2000s, there was a fabulous, amazing football player by the name of Chad Johnson. He was a wide receiver for the Cincinnati Bengals. He was one of the fastest people on the surface of the planet. In fact, one time as a, a charity event in Cincinnati, when he was there, he raced a horse. It was an activity that had only been once before uh, by a different wide receiver in Cincinnati. Um, and that different uh, one many, many years later, I mean before, lost. But Chad Johnson actually beat the horse in a foot race. He was an amazing wide receiver with amazing speed who got an incredibly big head like most wide receivers do and started calling himself by his number, 85, or what he thought was the Spanish equivalent of that, Ocho Cinco. All right, so many of you have probably heard of Ocho Cinco. He is a tremendous follow on Twitter if you follow him and occasionally will give out free money for those who uh, beg for it. Uh, but Amazing individual, super fast, and one of the most impressive things about him is he had these huge, massive cast muscles. In the early 2000s, when he was playing at his peak, there was an implant company who paid him a million dollars to take a mold of his calf muscles. Because as you, as a mere mortal, may not be able to have calves quite as impressive as Chad Ochocinco, and the same way you're not, if you're not happy with your bust size, you can get breast implants. Turns out you can also get calf implants. So they actually paid him a million dollars to take a mold of his calf muscles so they could make a cast so that they were able to make implants where if you didn't like the size of your calf muscles, you could have calf muscles just like Osho Senko, or at least the appearance of calf muscles just like Osho Senko. So it is the big, superficial, two-bellied, prominent, right, show-off muscle located over, over a bone. The humerus for the bicep brachia, the tibia for the gastrocnemius. Now, we indeed have two bellies. So when we are identifying these, uh, we need to identify the two bellies. And the good thing about them is one is on the medial side and one is on the lateral side. So that's how we identify them as medial and lateral. The medial head is going to be medial and up head. And the lateral head is going to be lateral. So we need to identify those those ways. And of course, we also then need to identify their origins. What is the origin of the medial head of the gastrocnemius? Medial condyle of the femur. Excellent. Now notice, we're not going to want it on the knuckle, because the knuckle is where it forms the joint of the knee when you get pinched. So where it is actually located is right here. There's a little notch on the femur above the condyle. It's still considered the condyle, but not the oval part where it forms the joint. So that is going to be its origin. And what's the origin of the lateral head? The exact same, exactly. The lateral condyle of the femur. So one belly. On one side, the medial belly on the medial side, the lateral belly on the lateral side. However, they both come into the same common tendon, the largest tendon in the body. And what is that largest tendon in the body? The calcaneal tendon, excellent. 
Calcaneal tendon is called the calcaneal tendon because it attaches to the calcaneus, right? The heel bone of it there. However, the calcaneal tendon has another very famous name. What is the other famous name of it? Excellent. It is the Achilles tendon. If we go back to the picture from our textbook, we see this really, really nicely. Here we see this nice, big, prominent tendon that attaches to the heel, right? Because in certain uh, versions of uh, Greek mythology, Achilles, who was one of the prominent heroes of the Trojan War, uh, was the daughter of a uh, river sphinx, a uh, river, uh, sorry, a river fairy or whatever it was. Uh, and uh, she, uh, to try to uh, help Achilles, uh, dipped him in the river Styx uh, to make him immortal and his skin impenetrable to weapons. But she had to hold him by the heel. And as she hold him, held him by the heel, uh, he, uh, or in the fire, I guess, depending on which version you listen to, uh, had to hold him by the heel. And so that was just one place where he was vulnerable. And that is an, ultimately where he was killed by an arrow shot into the heel region. All right. So that is the, 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 the mythology of that and where it gets its name. And again, because it is so ubiquitous, if you want to use the term Achilles tendon, I'm okay with that. As I mentioned, it is the strongest tendon in the body. Has anyone here torn their Achilles tendon or been around someone where their Achilles tendon has been torn? If you haven't, you are very lucky. If you've, uh, uh, again, a couple years ago, it was quite prominent uh, when it happened to, um, uh, what was the guy's name? The uh, basketball player uh, for the Warriors, um, Kevin Durant. When it happened to Kevin Durant, and one of the, well, I say cool things, because again, it's cool for me, because from an academic standpoint, it's interesting. Of course, it's not cool when it actually happened to him. But one of the amazing things about it, I'll say it that way, is with, there's so much tension in there, when it tears, you can actually see the jiggle in the muscle. You can see the tension in the muscle changes as this tendon is pulled up into the upper compartment of the leg. If you've ever had it or been in an area where with somebody when it's occurred, uh, you ask the people and their first thought is they got shot because there's this loud bang and they go down. The tearing of the Achilles can sometimes be so loud, it can be heard up to 100 yards away when it's occurring. So you can be at a, at a uh, soccer game and have someone tear their Achilles and everybody hears it when it occurs. There is so much tension in this tendon uh, that, like I said, it's like a shot when it tears. It's a, a, a devastating injury to the individual. And because it's a tendon and poorly vascularized, because it typically tears by going across, it heals very slowly, typically taking one to two years for it to heal uh, and even then, it may never be as strong and as prominent and as explosive and powerful as it was before. It is, again, a devastating and dynamic injury when it occurs. All right. And, of course, now that I've changed pictures, we've lost it, but i got to go back and redraw it again because there's one other key point that I wanted to make. So, oops, there and there. So, origin of the lateral head, origin of the medial head, and insertion. Notice our gastrocnemius shares one more characteristic with our bicep brachia. Our bicep brachia sits on top of the humerus, but did it actually attach to the humerus? No, it attached to the scapula and it attached to the radius. Notice the gastrocnemius sits over the tibia, but it doesn't actually attach to it. It attaches to the femur above it and to the calcaneus below it. Notice that does allow it to cross two joints, the knee and the ankle. And as such, how many actions does it get? Two, excellent. Uh, those two actions are being a posterior muscle. It is going to flex the knee. And let's cheat and draw an ankle real quickly. Here is our tibia and our fibula. Here is our foot. Excellent. All right, you can see the amazing art. And of course, as we know, the tibia and the fibula 
have those big uh, malleoluses, the medial malleolus and lateral malleolus that are going to be the hinge point for the foot. When we're dealing with tendons, if a tendon comes behind the medial and lateral malleolus, then what's going to happen is it pulls the heel up, and that action would, of course, be a plantar flexion. Whereas if the tendon comes in front of the medial and lateral malleolus, it is going to pull the toes up, and that would be a dorsiflexion. Being a posterior muscle, it, of course, goes behind the hinge, so its action is going to be to flex the knee and plantar flex the foot. And our last group is group three. Group three, what'd you come up with for the two actions of the gastrocnemius? Um, okay, so my partner came up with testing the pool water with your foot while sitting on your butt by the pool. So I'm gonna try my best to see if I can whatever. Demonstrate that for us? Yes, okay. I think your description is perfect. I think that totally works, but show us, if you can show us, that'd be awesome. Um, so this is, you're sitting, and okay. you're going to tiptoe and check to see. There you go. Lot. See, you're flexing your knee, but you're also plantar flexing your foot. Perfect. Excellent. That's a great one. Who came up with that? Um, Candid. Oh, okay. So, okay. So that might, that, that might explain it. See, for me, as I've mentioned, I have two daughters. I have a wife. We have two dogs, both of which are female. I swim in the estrogen ocean. And... Because I swim in the estrogen ocean, of course, one of the things that always happens is the Hallmark Channel is on pretty much all the time on at least one of the TVs in the house, right? One of the great things about the Hallmark Channel, especially in the crazy, insane world that we live in now, is there are these great, incredibly formulaic uh, movies that are all essentially identical. Someone is dead at the beginning of the movie, husband, wife you know, father, mother, somebody is dead at the beginning of the movie. The two people hate each other at first. They fall in love with each other. If they kiss early, they're going to break up. If they don't kiss early, then they don't get together till the end. But the one thing that all these movies have in common is that at the end of the movie, you get that true love kiss. And what is the key that lets you know that it's that true love kiss, right? When they're doing that kiss, you get the flex of the knee and the point of the toe. So while they're making out, you get the flex of the knee and the point of the toe with the gastrocnemius, and you know that it is for happily ever after. So there you go. There you go, foot pop. That foot pop, that is the um, true love kiss that you get at the end of every single Hallmark movie. All right, excellent. Questions on that? All right, perfect. Now, there is one last way that the gastrocnemius is like the bicep brachia. The bicep brachia is the two bellied superficial muscle on top that has a deep muscle underneath it that helps it do its job, the brachialis. Same thing is here. Notice over here on the right hand picture. <laughs> yes, the, my wife and my daughter know that I uh, use them as examples and make fun of them all the time. And usually I get the same response from all three of them. When I do that, they just roll their eyes at me and ignore me. So yes, so, that, so they're all well aware of it, but uh, I get plenty of eye rolls uh, from them uh, for these examples. All right especially Little. She's, she's about to turn 13, and she is by far the worst of all of them. So yeah, Little is the worst. Uh, but yes, they all just roll their eyes at me and ignore me. Because again, I've been using these examples for, well, however long I've had them. So uh, again, it's, uh, it amuses me. See, here's one of the things that you should learn about me. If you have not figured this out yet, I tend to be somewhat sarcastic. But the other thing that I will tell you about me is all the jokes I tell, I tell for me. I tell the jokes because they amuse me. If anybody else gets them and laughs at them, then that's just bonus. But all the jokes I tell, I'm telling for me to amuse myself. So this is so all the humor is for me. If you get it, great. If not, I'm okay with that because I'm telling them for me. <laughs> so there you go. All right, excellent. Okay, so last similarity between the bicep brachia and the gastrocnemius is there is a deep muscle underneath them that helps them. 
In this case, and this is a cool picture, I love this picture from your textbook, because what they have done is not just remove the gastrocnemius, but the other thing they've done is they have cut the deep muscle. And they've cut the deep muscle so that you can see that in this small compartment in the back of your leg, we have this big, broad, flat muscle. Because that's where this muscle gets its name. This muscle is based on the fish, the sole fish. The sole fish is a broad, flat fish that swims along the bottom of the lake bed. And it's broad and it's flat. Well, this is a broad, flat muscle that is kind of rolled up into this compartment. And so that's what we can see. It is rolled up into this compartment. And when we look at the origin and the insertion for it, what is the origin of the soleus? The head and the proximal shaft of the fibula and the superior tibia. Excellent. So notice it starts over here on the head and the shaft of the fibula, comes across the tibia, and basically down the other side. So we have this nice U-shaped origin uh, that is here, but notice it's below the knee, so it doesn't affect the knee. And its insertion is the same as the gastrocnemius. In fact, the two muscles come together into the same tendon. Right. If we take a peek, I think I have one more picture I wanted to show you on our model. Excellent. I wanted to show you the lateral compartment of the leg. That's why I have this picture and some other stuff. But notice what we see here as we look closely at this picture. And I will highlight them uh, first in, uh, let's go yellow first. Here is that superficial lateral belly of the gastrocnemius, and we can see a little bit of the white of the calcaneal tendon that takes it into the calcaneus. But notice from this lateral view, we can also now clearly see that there is a deep muscle here beneath it, but this deep muscle also attaches to the calcaneal tendon, and attaches to the calcaneus. In fact, there's a little gap in between. And so that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing that deep soleus muscle here, deep underneath it, but they're both connecting to the same insertion point. They're both connecting behind the malleoli, so they're both going to plantar flex the foot, right? But the soleus doesn't go above the knee, and so since it doesn't go above the knee, it only has one action, and that one action is to plantar flex the foot. So this one allows you to stand up on your tippy toes. So this one is helping to maintain your balance, can stand you up on your tippy toes, right? So you can reach that top shelf without having to bend the knee. So just like the brachialis helps to flex, the, the uh, soleus helps to plantar flex the foot. All right. Questions on that? So again, notice here on the superficial view, again, we see that broader soleus coming out from the sides, but also connecting by that calcaneus into the heel. All right, there is just one more muscle we need to know the origin and the insertion of. Good question. I was slightly yes. confused. I thought that that the gastrocnemius, gastrocnemius would be the one helping the tippy toe parts. Can you help elaborate? They both. Elaborate? Both the gastrocnemius and the soleus are going to plantar flex the foot. So both are powerful muscles that allow us to stand up on our tippy toes. However, because the gastrocnemius crosses the knee joint, it can also flex the knee, whereas the soleus doesn't cross the knee joint, so it doesn't have any other action other than getting up on your tippy toes. But you're right, both of them allow you to get up on your tippy toes. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. That's why you wear the high heel shoes, right? When you wear the high heel shoes, or at least when I do, it points your toe, it plantar flexes your foot. And so what happens? Your gastrocnemius, your soleus are in a state of tension and it makes your leg look shapier. Shapier? Shapier. I like it. We'll stick with it. All right. But like I said, at least that's why I wear them. And so that I can be taller. All right, excellent. 
Last muscle, you need to know the origin and the insertion of. Now, I like this picture from your textbook too, because as you can see on this tibia, there is a whole lot of stuff coming on. Here on the tibial tuberosity, you have four muscles that insert. Rectus femoris, vastus intermedius, vastus lateralis, vastus medialis. Four muscles all inserting into the tibial tuberosity. Over here on the median condyle, you have four muscles inserting. Semimembranosus, semitendinosus, gracilis, and sartorius. So there's a whole lot going on on the front of our tibia. But obviously, we also have a muscle on the front of our tibia, because if you look at the name, it is called the tibialis anterior. So it kind of comes across the anterior part, but if we look at the bone, as we look down here at the bone, is there really any place for it? So let's use black. There really isn't any room for a muscle. Oh, that's way too big. So there, undo that, and make it black. There really is no place for a muscle to attach to the tibial tuberalis because we have four things there. There's really no room for anything to attach to the medial condyle because we have four muscles coming in there. So notice the origin, even though it's the tibialis anterior, its origin is actually over here on the lateral condyle of the tibia. But being the anterior muscle, it is going to come across, crosses the anterior side. So where does it insert? Where does the tibialis anterior insert? Medial cuneiform and then the lateral, sorry, not lateral, first metatarsal bone. Excellent. Over here on these two. And what's cool is it actually does it on the plantar surface. It actually comes underneath. So what this fiber does, what this muscle does, and I'm gonna cheat a little bit, it comes, uh, hold on, I'll use black for that, so let's use orange. It comes down and then actually comes up underneath and attaches to the inferior surface of the medial cuneiform and that first metatarsal. So notice if we go back to the picture from your textbook, here we have this muscle. Starts laterally over here, lateral on the tibia, comes across and then goes up and underneath the foot on the medial side. This helps us to understand its action. Uh, lost my list. All right, we'll worry about that later. Helps us to understand its action. Clearly it is coming in front of the medial and lateral malleolus. It is the tibialis anterior after all. So that means it is gonna lift the toes up. And so, of course, what action would that be? Lifting the toes up would be dorsiflexion. Excellent. But if you think about it, if this was my left, pardon me, my right foot, the tendon of this comes down and wraps around and connects to the underside. So not only does it bring the toes up, but it also can turn the toes so that they would point medially. And what is that action where you turn the toes so that it points them medially? Inversion. Inversion, right? So that I can see if I've stepped on a piece of gum. So those are the two actions of the tibialis anterior. There's one more thing I wanna talk about with the tibialis anterior. Notice we saw there is this posterior compartment where there are a lot of muscles on the posterior part of the leg. We have this lateral compartment where there are a lot of muscles on the lateral part of the leg. Notice there really isn't a medial compartment because this is where what we commonly think of as our shin bone is, but is really just the diaphysis of our tibia, 
right? You can feel that bone down there. That's what hurts so badly when you run into the coffee table in the middle of the night. So this poor tibialis anterior kind of is just hanging out here by itself. In fact, not only is it, oh, I don't like that color. Not only is it hanging out here by itself, but it has its own little connective tissue sheath that wraps around it and supports it. Normally those fascias wrap around bundles of muscles, but this doesn't have a bundle of muscles. It's just a muscle by itself. Now, there isn't necessarily anything inherently wrong with a fascia just wrapping around one muscle. But the only problem with it is, is that connective tissues, fascias, are made up of dense, irregular connective tissues, which are primarily collagen fibers. Whereas, obviously, a muscle is made up of muscle tissue. And muscle tissue is dynamic, and muscle tissue can swell with blood, and muscle tissue, as it gets used, becomes inflamed and becomes enlarged. And do collagen fibers expand and relax as easily as muscle tissue does? No. So one of the things that can happen with this tibialis anterior, especially to an old man like me, if being an old man, I finally decide, you know what, I'm going to jump off the couch and I'm going to go run five miles this morning before class. All right. My daughter, right, who was up till uh, two o'clock last night, big was up till two o'clock last night watching TV. Uh, and she I made the mistake of introducing her into Firefly. So she was working her way through the series there and stayed up all night watching it. Um, she could probably bounce up right now out of bed and go run five miles without an issue. But I, on the other hand, would have some problems with that. After the first, I don't know, mile or so, as that muscle becomes swollen and enlarged, it's going to get constricted within that fibrous connective tissue. And as it gets restricted within that fibrous connective tissue, the muscle becomes congested. I have trouble getting blood to it and it can start to become very irritated and sore and start to get the sensation where every time I take a step, it feels like that muscle is gonna rip off my bone. And what do we call that condition? Shin splints, exactly. Shin splints is caused by a congestion of blood in the tibialis anterior. Right. One of the things that I need to do before I go running five miles is I need to stretch, stretching out the legs, stretching out those muscles, because as you stretch the leg and stretch the muscles, that helps to loosen that connective tissue to give more space for that muscle to enlarge. And so stretching ahead of time really, really helps with that. Now, are there some individuals that no matter how long they stretch are still going to have problems with shin splints? As a result of that, yes, because of the differences in morphology, differences in anatomy. In rare instances, one of the things they will do is go in and cut that connective tissue sheath. And as they do that, that can, again, it's not a common way that they, they heal this or they resolve this issue, but in some instances, it can cause immediately, res uh, it can, can immediately resolve that issue by helping to loosen that up so that the muscle can function more freely in space. Now, there are other implications when you cut the connective tissue, like with circulation and things along those lines, but uh, it can, in some extreme cases, they will use that for extreme shin splint issues because of that restriction in there. All right, questions on that? Excellent, I believe we just have two more muscles then, correct? Those two muscles are located here uh, in the lateral compartment of the leg. And while I like them here, let's go back here. Notice here, we see these two muscles as well. So let's start first. I don't remember what order they're in on your handout, so I will do them in the order that I want. Let's start here with this muscle here. This muscle here, notice there isn't anything particularly special or unique looking about its belly. But once again, if we follow its tendon, just like we did in the forearm, lo and behold, the tendon branches and goes to the digits of the foot. What did we call that muscle that did that in the forearm? 
extensor digitorum longus. Extensum digitorum in the forearm. In the forearm. Here in the leg, we have a muscle that is going to be able to extend the toes. But notice its tendon has to go a little further to get to the toes. So this muscle, while this muscle in the forearm is the extensor digitorum, this muscle in the leg is the say it. You already said it. Say it again. Extensor digitorum longus. Extensor digitorum longus. Exactly. All right. Not the equivalent muscles. Extensor digitorum, forearm, moves the fingers. Extensor digitorum, longus, leg, extends the foot, extends the toes. And because it comes in front of the medial malleolus and the lateral malleolus, how many actions does this muscle have? Two. It is going to dorsiflex the foot bring the toes up and extend the toes out. All right, this is the one when you step out outside right after the rain and you step on a, a nail, right? When you step on a snail, not only do you pull your foot away, but you kind of flare the toes. Oh, gross, as you step on that from that process there. All right, so that is that muscle. And notice here, on the lateral aspect of the leg is a small bellied muscle with a very long tendon on the lateral aspect of the leg. And what is the name for the lateral aspect of the name of the leg? If only I'd learned my regional terms in this class, I might be able to remember what the lateral region of the lower leg was called. Anyone? True, fibularis is one of the terms for it. Peroneus is the other term for it. So here we have a muscle on the lateral aspect of the leg with a long tendon. So it is the fibularis longus or the peroneus longus. Both are acceptable names for it. Being a lateral muscle, not surprisingly, it is going to evert the foot. But to know whether it pulls the heel up or whether it pulls the toe up, we need to look at the tendon. And while it is a lateral muscle, notice its tendon goes behind the lateral malleolus. And if it goes behind the lateral malleolus, it is going to bring the heel up. So this one, right? Everts the foot and does it plantar flex or does it dorsiflex? Plantar flexes the foot. There you go. So this plantar flex and everts the foot. And there you go. Just that easily, we have identified all the muscles, all the origins all the insertions, all the actions that you are responsible for on the exam. That is everything you ever wanted to know about muscles and more. Questions on that or anything else? Yeah, I got a question. Um, can you uh, tell us like some of the um, possible essay questions that we can have on the exam. I already have. I guaranteed you that there are seven essay questions that you will have two of, right? What were those seven essay questions again? Initiation of the communication at the neuromuscular junction. What else? Termination, excellent. Modification. Now again, remember with modification, I won't ask modification. I will ask you how does Botox modify 
communication at the neuromuscular junction or how does, you know, uh, uh, something else, uh, some other type of toxin or something like that that I can give you, something along those lines. Excellent. Uh, what else? The initiation of the excitation contract, not contraction, coupling. Excellent. Initiation of excitation, contraction, coupling. What else? Termination, excellent, and I'll write it that way too. Termination of excitation, contraction, coupling. What else? True. Although really, remember for contractile cycle, it's pretty much there is initiation, it's all contractile cycle, and then it's a cycle. So contractile cycle, right? So describe the process of the contractile cycle. We're not going to worry about, right, termination or modifying or anything like that. So just the process of the contractile cycle. And there was one more. Relaxation of the muscle. Excellent. So like I said, I guarantee two of these essay questions are going to be on your exam and possibly more. But in general, again, being the sophisticated student that you are, what you should be doing is looking at processes, looking at descriptions, things that you can describe, things that you can explain. Right? We talked about wave summation. We called about, talked about trepi. We talked about the arrangement of the proteins, the anatomy of a muscle. We talked about, uh, what did we talk about today? Uh, we talked about producing energy. Today we talked about how the cardiac muscle and smooth muscle are gonna attract. At this point, at the end of a lecture, you should be able to go back through your notes of those lectures. You should be able to go back through the notes and probably pull out six, eight, 10 possible essay questions based on the things we talked about. Because again, as you've seen, where you have to describe things, where you have to compare things, where you have to you know, list things, those are the types of things that make good essay questions. So those are the types of things that you're definitely going to be responsible for on the exam. Again, I don't have a problem telling you that two of these seven essay questions are going to be essay questions on the exam because I know you're going to have to put a buttload of work into studying them to be able to be successful on them. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, I'll be around today and most of tomorrow. So if you have more questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, I strongly encourage you to go to the open lab and uh, work with uh, Jeff uh, to help to make sure master the material. Ask him to see some of the deeper muscles, ask him to see some of the weirder views of the models and the materials to help you to be successful in identifying these things on the exam. Uh, good luck on uh, Thursday. Uh, obviously I will be available if you have problems. We the number of problems have gone down significantly since the first exam. Uh, there were several warnings that I had to give people on the exams though, and I was fairly generous with it this time, but I'm going to start being more strict about it. Remember, you are responsible for slowly scanning your entire work area. That doesn't just mean the left side of your work area, right? Or it doesn't just mean being up here in space. I want a slow scan of your entire working area, left, right, and all around, down. Show me what's on your table. Show me what's around you. Um, should you have another computer set up at the table where you're working? I know many of you have desktop tech. I have one right now. Almost died. I have my other computer, my older computer, my laptop, which is practically dead, connected to a monitor right here. And it doesn't work unless the monitors, I mean, unless my other computer is on, and obviously my laptop is on top of that. But I don't know that. If I see that there's a monitor there, how do I know that it's not on? So make sure you're scanning your area slowly. Make sure you have appropriate lighting so that I can see. Show me your workspace. If you're not showing me your complete workspace, people are going to start losing serious points as a result of it. You can lose 10% of your grade. That guarantees you cannot get an A on this exam. 
So it is important to do that. We have to maintain the integrity of this. So please be mindful and respectful of that. Find a good place that is uh, doesn't have a lot of clutter on it that you can take this test on and show that area to show me that the work that you're putting into this is your work and not something else. All right. I know how hard you guys are working for this. So show me that. Be obvious about it. All right. Beat me over the head with how obvious it is so that everybody is comfortable with that. All right. Any other questions? All right. Enjoy your day off. Work hard. Good luck on your exam Thursday. And I will see you for lecture bright and early on Friday morning. Take care.